اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم فرسٹ آف آل آئی وڈ لائک ٹو ویلکم آل دا پارٹیسپینٹس ٹو دس ایونٹ آن بہاف آف دا سول اینڈ انوائرمنٹ ڈپارٹمنٹ دس ایونٹ از آرگنائز بائی دا ڈپارٹمنٹ انڈر دا بینر آف دا ککس دس از ٹیکنیکل فورم دیر آر ٹوٹل سیون اسپیکرس ان شاء اللہ اسٹارٹنگ ود می uh and this forum is on recent developments in civil and environmental engineering uh inshallah uh, this is just a beginning uh, of our uh, lectures from the department this is the first uh, well organized uh, forum and inshallah it will continue uh, frequently so since it's the first forum by the department uh it will be mostly introductory uh technical forum uh, okay uh, so first uh, just to begin with uh i would like to give a highlights of uh, the department uh in fact uh, about our strength that is always mostly gauged by the active faculty members highly qualified and active faculty members the laboratory staff as well as our lab equipment research facilities our capability to do research work our capability to do good teaching after highlighting these things i would i would like to uh, highlight about our undergraduate and graduate programs and uh, the research activities going on um, in the department uh, particularly in the last one decade so let me begin with uh, a small history of the civil and environmental engineering department uh, the c department is one of the oldest departments of kfupm uh, kfupm started in the year 1963 around 59 years before if we count with gregorian okay if you go with the hijri it will be more and uh, the bs program bachelor of science in civil engineering started uh, with the start of the university so, so so the the age of our department is equal to the age of the university then <clears throat> in 1972 73 the department started the master degree program and followed by that in 1985 86 around 35 37 years before uh, the Dep- ce department also started the phd program before moving to the college of design and built environment which is our current college in 2021 last year the ce department was the part of college of engineering but uh, this department is now paired with very relevant departments uh, like uh, architecture engineering architecture department city and regional planning construction engineering and management so these are the very uh, the, these departments are very close to uh, our department uh, technically so i think we have gone to a right place inshallah where uh, together all five departments together can make a difference in the area of uh, construction and developing the infrastructures okay then after this brief history i would like to uh, inform that we are having four clear specialization or we can say option areas first structural and materials then environmental engineering and water resources geotechnical engineering and transportation engineering so in fact uh, at all the three levels bs ms and phd uh, these areas are or uh, or or you know um, clearly uh, distinguished Uh, in terms of you know electives at the bs level any students who are interested in structures and material they mostly take the elective in that area uh, and so so on with the other option area at the master and phd level this distinction is very clear right from the beginning even at the time of admission we make it clear to the students that you are in this area uh, okay in this specialization so we have four uh specialization in the department now coming to the faculty and staff of ce department uh we have all together 31 faculty currently 
out of 31 faculty 18 faculty members are saudi 13 are non saudi from at least 5 6 nationalities uh among 31 faculty members we have eight full professors seven associate professors nine assistant professor four lecturer out of four three uh, have gone for doing phd these are saudi uh, lecturers uh okay and uh, there are three graduate uh, assistant saudi graduate students now if we go uh, specialization wise so you will find that there are 14 faculty members all together 1414 in the structures and materials eight faculty members in transportation engineering and four faculty members in water resources and environment actually this number was six but two two faculty members recently left the department rather i can say three faculty members left the department but there is an entry of one new faculty member at the same time and there are five faculty members in geotechnical uh, engineering we have a total 16 staff that include the laboratory engineers secretaries and other supporting staff so with 31 faculty members and 16 staff the department alhamdulillah has good uh, manpower to run the department still we 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 are in the process of uh, recruiting some very highly specialized faculty and also some highly specialized laboratory technicians okay. now coming to the laboratory facility in the department uh, around 13 different laboratories we have in the ce department that include concrete lab structural lab heavy structure testing lab also we call it as a reaction floor lab also we can say strong floor lab then we have non destructive testing lab ndt lab surveying lab traffic engineering lab highway materials lab water resources lab environmental engineering lab uh, mainly dedicated to the teaching in general but there is a one, one specific lab in environmental engineering which is dedicated mostly to the research then there is a microbiology lab a geotechnical engineering lab and we have four computer labs so i would like to uh, tell about some major equipment in different uh, laboratories so let us start with the structure and materials lab uh, mashallah we have four different sets of universal testing machine utm with different uh, capacity and specifications okay so that we can uh, accommodate uh, testing specimens requiring uh, different uh, load capacity and uh, co one compression testing machine that can apply a load as high as 3000 kilo newton that can be utilized to test the high performance material high performance concrete ultra high performance concrete then there is a tensile testing machine compression testing machine electrical oven and so on so forth and then there are equipment which are used for ndt and the and and the, the test related to durability of the concrete then moving to the highway engineering lab Uh, okay uh, mashallah this lab is state of the art lab like the structure lab and one of the lab uh, one of the most uh, advanced lab uh, in the entire region alhamdulillah and have a series of uh, major equipment you can see here a lot uh, yani uh, around 29 uh, different equipments are there covering all the aspects of highway materials research teaching as well as research they're coming to the surveying lab we have theodolite digital level total station automatic level and G gps and in our uh, you know water resources lab we have turbidity meter conductivity meter atomic absorption spectrometer iron chromo uh, chromatograph ph meter and so on so forth uh, this lab uh, uh, is a water resources and environmental together okay mm, then going to uh, you know soil and geotechnical lab so we have uh, these are the major but uh, this is not limited the list is not uh, here. we we have so many other uh, other setups also uh, okay now coming to the uh, computer lab so we have as i said earlier four computer labs and uh, in these four labs we have 88 computers and we have one Uh, printer in each of our four computer laboratories in order to set in order to uh, cater the need of our students working in the 
in these computer laboratories. And these are the state of the art software being utilized in different op uh, option areas uh, of the CE department, StatPro, Black Seas, Nexus, Abacus, Visim, AutoTurn, ParkCAD, Torus, Vistro, and so on and so forth. So we have 13 software, major software being used. Mostly these StatPro very commonly used, uh, uh, is used by the senior design project students. Uh, and others, and this abacus very much frequently used by the uh, further structural modeling or any other general modeling also. Okay, and uh, here most of the other software they are related to uh, traffic engineering, transportation management. Now I can show some of the photographs of our major equipment in the structural lab. Here this is the UTM, one example, having 600 kilonewton capacity. Okay, there is another UTM machine, 300 kilonewton, and they are quite adjustable. I and mean, we can conduct uh, test on so many types of specimens requiring uh, uh, just to ensure failure in compression, in tension, in flagger, in shear. Okay, and then here we have a special uh, compression testing machine for concrete specimen uh, mostly. These are the two uh, UTM. Now, uh, this is the these are the photographs taken from our uh, you know reaction floor lab or you can say strong floor lab here see this uh, there is a there is a crane and we can we can uh, shift our large size specimen uh, to the point of testing uh, using this crane uh, okay and uh, uh, we 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 can apply uh, the load to to large size beam even we have tested uh, the beams, uh, very strong beams. Uh, you can, I can, I can show here one photograph where a beam specimen is ready for testing. You can see the, there are load cells of required capacity, and then we put here uh, devices to uh, to measure the deflection uh, at the mid span most of the time, and uh, also we 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 place the strain gauges in such a uh, uh, big specimen uh, to, to measure the development of strain when the load is applied and we record everything till the failure of the beam. Now going uh, to measure equipment utilized in environment engineering lab. Here it is atomic absorption spectrometer. Okay, then, then this is the inductive, inductively grouped plasma optical emission spectrometer, then mercury analyzer, and here, gas chromo chromatography, mass spectrometer, high performance liquid uh, chromatography, iron, and cro I, uh, iron chromatography. That means we have uh, tried to encompass all the state of the art equipment in our environmental engineering laboratory. Here, uh, the geotechnical lab, uh, the equipment, I'm not, I'm not showing all the equipment, some major here, these are the sieve sets for sieve analysis. This is the set for uh, determination of all the Atterberg limits of, on soil sample. And this is the direct shear test. We have also tri axial uh, test setup, which is the photograph is not here. And then going to surveying lab, we have theodolite, we have total station, we have the GPS set, and uh, we are conducting tests for our BSc student using all these uh, state of the art surveying equipment. Then these are the equipment uh, in transportation engineering. Uh, okay, bending beam rheometer, thin film open test. This, the, I mean, this is the highway materials uh, uh, lab equipment. Dynamic shear rheometer, uh, and conducted to test uh, to conduct the test on asphalt and and asphalt concrete. That also involved preparation of the specimen and then testing. So these are the di different equipments utilized there. Then this is the one of the photograph of one of our four computer laboratories. Like this, we have four computer labs, as I mentioned in the beginning. Now, having uh, the manpower and the laboratory facilities, what are, are our capabilities? What we can do or what we have been doing so far? Okay, so uh, I can quickly go uh, specialization by specialization. So uh, under structures and material, uh, testing of materials and structural components, concrete durability and problems of concreting, concrete protection, repair, retrofitting, non-destructive testing, okay, 
uh, static and dynamic analysis of structure, design verification and alternative design, rating of bridges and other structures, and many more. These are few of uh, several examples. Then going to environmental engineering, here capabilities towards wastewater treatment, air pollution monitoring, watershed modeling, simulation and design of urban water supply and drainage system, water distribution network analysis and testing, risk analysis in water resources and environmental engine, environmental system, study uh, containment, contaminant transport and treatment system, environmental impact studies. So these are the different, uh, different things which we have been doing, okay, uh, in water and resources. And then coming to geotechnical engineering, uh, characterization of soil and materials for roads and foundations, soil structure inter interaction analysis and testing, study dynamics, study of dynamics of soils, foundation engineering, ground con contamination and remediation, design of construction and landfill. And uh, lastly, transportation engineering, test on asphalt and aggregate properties, martial foam asphalt and super uh, gyratory mixed design and testing, pavement, uh, uh, profilograph traffic flow analysis and modeling in urban and highway road networks, traffic capacity and level of service estimation in highways, uh, arter arterials and intersections, analysis and estimation of signalization, delays, queuing and uh, tollway system, design and implementation of traffic management system. Uh, so we have been doing. Now, um, after our capabilities, uh, what we are going uh, what we are doing in teaching and research. So first of all, I would like to go through our BS programs. So we have two BS degree programs in our department. BS in civil engineering, we abbreviate as CE. BS in applied civil engineering, this is ACE. There is not a big difference between these two programs, uh, but there is a significant difference. Uh, as as it, it is clear uh, in almost all the departments, engineering departments of the university, this AC uh, this applied program has the co-op, cooperative training. The students go for uh, for for uh, eight weeks, around eight weeks, to the companies, and they do the work there, and then they write the report and they make the presentation. On contrary, uh, the CE student they take a little bit more credit hours and a course. Uh, in terms of courses, um, and they go for summer training instead of co-op, which is of a short duration as, as compared to the co-op. Otherwise, there is not a big difference between these two programs. Sometimes the students, they start CE, go to ACE, and vice versa, uh, just after gaining the confidence. Okay. Then uh, recently, uh, under, the, under the very strong drive of our KFPM, uh, to launch CX, CX program and MX program. We have been active uh, like other departments, other colleges, and uh, already developed three uh, CX program approved and ready to offer. First is climatic change adaptation. Uh, okay. And uh, then traffic engineering and waste management. Uh, students have uh, shown some interest, uh, but the list is uh, to be updated and uh, we hope that uh, we might offer uh, all three programs in coming fall semester, inshallah. Let us see. Uh, that will depend on uh, finally how many students have joined each of the CX program. Then two, two CX, another two CX programs, they are being developed at, and at very advanced stages. Uh, first is construction quality assurance and control, and then durability of marine structures. So these are the two coming up. And hopefully, inshallah, before summer, uh, they will be approved. Uh, they will pass through all the, all the checks and balances. And inshallah, we hope that they will be approved by the university board. Now, coming to our master programs. So we have MS degree programs with thesis. Again, under all four option areas or concern, concentration area, or you can say specializations of civilian department. And the same programs are there, but they are without thesis and, and, and the name of the program is Master of Engineering, M Engineering degree program. Uh, here, this MS degree program, the, uh, these, these four programs, all of them are 30 of 30 credit hours, 24 credit hours we devote for coursework and six for thesis. Here, M Engineering, we have 33 credit hours, 30 credit hours are devoted for lectures, 
and three last three credit hours for project master master project okay then coming to the mx program we have already got one program approved and ready uh, to be offered and that is intelligent transportation engineering already approved and ready another mx program being developed along with the two cx program which i mentioned in the last slide and this this mx program title is advanced material for sustainable and durable concrete structures so we hope that inshallah this also will be completed and in the entire procedure now coming to the phd degree programs again in all four option areas uh, we are having the students for phd okay and our phd program uh, is of uh, you know uh, 40 42 credit hours okay we have we have uh, 30 30 credit hours for coursework and uh, remaining for the thesis work now <clears throat> coming to the research area in the structures and material in all four areas where, what we are doing uh, in last uh, few years uh, okay or i can say uh, in last few decades i uh, but most recently these topics are listed uh, which are uh, which are uh, being explored and the research works being conducted in these areas recently so modeling in structural engineering mostly we are using finite element modeling and also sometimes we are using boundary element method uh, by our faculty members who are involved in structural engineering modeling then uh, development of advanced concrete materials uh, using uh, nano nano uh, particles material like carbon nanotube graphene uh, many many new new admixtures have come uh, which which are capable of changing the property of the concrete materials uh, tremendously unbelievably okay so all those things we are uh, we have included and we are uh, uh, in in pace with the entire world in, in in terms of our novelty of the research in this area and then the green concrete uh, is not the new concept it's the old concept uh, yani reducing the consumption of conventional uh, sources mainly the cement because cement is associated with the with the pollution so it's an old concept but now uh, it has got a lot of momentum uh, because uh, like other countries in the world kingdom of saudi arabia also moving towards sustainable development and sustainability also includes uh, the environmental protection okay and conservation of the natural resources any conventional sources of resources uh, 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 resources so green concrete being utilized using uh, being developed and utilized using the local waste materials for a long time now it has got more momentum then durability of concrete structures always it has been a challenge in most of the areas of the kingdom because uh, a significant portion of the kingdom is exposed to the marine environment okay and it is very much aggressive and it it was it caused problem for durability of concrete structure so this issue is being addressed for last i think four decades uh, and still it is uh, fresh and uh, the work is being conducted and a lot of uh, recommendations have been made uh, partially implemented by the industry yet we have to make sure that the the research outcomes uh, should go to the industrial uh, utilization to get full benefit of uh, the investment in the research then structural health monitoring, uh, repairing and strengthening of the concrete structures. 3D concrete printing is a new concept. And uh, now uh, the, uh, one more center is also involved, but here in the Department of Civil Engineering, we are focusing more on uh, developing the 3D concrete materials. Like we are developing the ink, okay? Uh, the printer, uh, is uh, the, the work on printing and a printer is being conducted by a particular center irc so inshallah we will work um, uh, in in a, in a multi multi dimension involving that center also okay to complete the printing but our focus mainly will be to develop the uh, the, the the high quality uh, ink concrete ink Okay, then moving to the trans research in transportation engineering area, uh, like, uh, and this, this is the list, traffic operations and management, optimization of urban traffic flow, traffic safety and crash analysis, modeling of mode choice behavior, 
application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the transportation engine, use of waste plastic. Now, these the, the first uh, five are, are related to you know uh, the traffic management, and the, this other uh, this use of waste plastic in asphalt, concrete for highway and road related to the highway materials, utilization of recycled crumb rubber uh, in asphalt concrete, evaluation of waste oils in re uh, rejuvenating the asphalt binders, uh, modeling of the performance of polymer modified. Uh, so the, the both groups, uh, we have two, two uh, uh, clear groups in transportation engine. One is the traffic group, another is the highway materials group. And both groups have been very active, many masters and PhD students recently did their thesis and made uh, uh, a lot of publications in ISI journals and uh, also uh, the, the highway metals group uh, have got uh, you know patents uh, several patents okay then the research area in water and environment so um, again here there are two groups one is the water group and another is the environmental group so uh, this environmental group has membrane bioreactors. They have worked on this. Then sewage sludge treatment and aerobic digestion of the sludge. Water distribution network. This is uh, this is again uh, related to water group. Uh, precipitation and flood modeling. Water quality modeling. Disinfection by products formation and risk modeling. Water footprint and reuse. Groundwater modeling. Development of novel adsorbents. This this again uh, this. Last but third is uh, from environment group, aqueous selenium pollution control and air pollution control. So these are the very uh, hot areas uh, globally, and uh, most of the and majority of these uh, these these topics are highly highly relevant to the to the condition of or uh, to the scenario of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia in water and environment. Then uh, uh, lastly, the geotechnical. Uh, let me tell you. Um, due to retirement of some of the very senior faculty members uh, from the geotechnical group, this uh, option area uh, was having deficit of the faculty member. But recently, we got two young, highly qualified, talented faculty members who have joined the department uh, just recently before uh, any at the start of the semester, this semester. And inshallah, we are going to again, again, uh, do the uh, state of the art research in this area of civil engineering as well uh, but let but I, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you that the geotechnical engineering option area at kfupm uh, really really went very deeply uh, two three uh, I, I can say two three decades since la for the last two three decades uh, these were the works in the last two three decades these were the, these were the uh, topics which were covered through the extensive research and many masters and PhD students did the uh, were involved and did a lot of publication in ISI journal. Soil Foundation interaction interaction in Safka environment of Eastern Saudi Arabia. Volume change behavior of arid calcareous soil. Soil stabilization using waste material. This is very very uh, uh, useful topic. Uh, directly it can benefit uh, uh, to the to the construction industry. Uh, or any infrastructure, infrastructure industry because, because uh, the quality of the soil uh, in most of the areas of the kingdom uh, is not that, that uh, high quality. Um, it needs uh, stabilization, which means uh, the, the bearing capacity of the soil should be enhanced uh, through different treatment. And this is the topic which is common between the, uh, the, the material group of structural material and the soil group, okay, uh, stabilization of the soil using the waste material, okay, and and recently uh, two projects were carried out uh, on soil stabilization, big projects, alhamdulillah, uh, with 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 a lot of publication. Then evaluation of uh, evaluation of liquefaction potential of soil, which is a problem mostly happened due to earthquake forces liquefaction. Uh, geotechnical characterization of problematic soils and their stabilization, improving engineering properties of dune sand, which is the which is a common sand in Saudi Arabia, evaluation of cavity stabilization under uh, unsaturated condition for granular materials, and analysis and design of buried pipelines. Now, uh, towards the end, I would like to tell that 
uh, we are lucky that uh, during the formation of different interdisciplinary research center, uh, a due consideration was given by the authority to create very, very much relevant, uh, a center very highly relevant to our department. And that center is Interdisciplinary Research Center for Construction and Building Materials. We, we say in short, IRC-CBM. And uh, here, is the, actually, uh, I, I requested Dr. Alvosta, who is the director of this center, to make the presentation. But he said that, inshallah, he will make uh, the presentation in detail uh, next time. And inshallah, he will be invited to give a full-fledged uh, lecture uh, about this center. Most of, more than 80% of our faculty members, CE department faculty members, are affiliates uh, of the center and other, uh, uh, other, uh, you know, mother, uh, sorry, uh, other departments of our college uh, are also affiliates. Some, some, some uh, faculty member from uh, chemistry, uh, Dr. Alosta uh, will tell, inshallah, next time uh, he can give the statistics of uh, affiliates, but I can tell that uh, huge number is there, and 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 we have already started uh, working in different areas under the banner of IRC CBM. We have uh, two postdoctoral fellow; uh, they have joined uh, the center, Alhamdulillah, and few uh, the recruitment recruitment of few more uh, postdoctoral fellows uh, are, uh, is in the pipeline. Inshallah, we hope. Very soon they will join. Uh, as Dr. Osta told, that one is coming, inshallah, in highway materials uh, area, uh, mainly on the pavement. So if he comes, it will be really uh, good and it will make uh, this uh, center more interdisciplinary. Okay, the mission of the center is to conduct high quality interdisciplinary research with the aim of developing energy conserving and environment friendly construction materials and system. So this center is not working only to develop the material. Uh, sometimes it is a, a little bit confusing that this is center only for material. No, this is for materials and developing the systems. Okay, and that can encompass many things, like 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 uh, uh, for which partic particular design, shape, size, scenario, weather condition, which material is suitable. So this paves way for the researchers from the other departments, other centers to, to join. So always let us remember always that it is not only building material center, but it is the center for the construction, anything related to development of infrastructure, uh, even that can include the design of the system. Sometimes, you know, uh, uh, we design the system and then we go for searching the material, okay, suitable for that particular design. But it can be other way around. We can develop the sustainable material and then we can, we can rule on the design. We can change the design. That is possible through the research work. Whichever uh, is better, that, that could be adapted. So that way, this center is highly, highly uh, any, you know, relevant to many departments and center. So I don't want to read because I have uh, now, I should stop because already uh, it is 35 minutes. Uh, uh, I, will, I should give the chance uh, to the participants to uh, raise any questions which I can answer, inshallah. So thank you for your kind attention. Now this is the time for taking some questions. Uh, I think uh, you can chat your question and I can reply. Okay. So I will wait for a few minutes, just waiting for your any concern, because uh, you know the there is no access for raising the voice. So you can just chat, and I can reply your, I can rebut your concern. Go ahead. We have 31 participants, including the panelists right now. Okay. Uh, any question from any participant, including our panelist? Please. Okay. So, I, uh, okay. Uh, let me tell you about the, uh, the other six lectures quickly. 
before I will give the floor to the next speaker, who is Dr. Ali Al Gadib. So <clears throat> we have three lectures before uh, before prayer, before the uh, break. Um, the second lecture is on attributes of civil engineering profession to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, past, present, and future. This lecture. Uh, is going to be delivered by Dr. Ali Al Gadib, who is our, our very uh, one of the senior most faculty members in the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, then that will be followed by water induced degradation of weak granule soil. So, this faculty uh, by Dr. Mubashir Aziz. This faculty is from geotechnical option area. That will be followed by lightweight cementitious composites, prospects, and challenges to be delivered by Dr. Asad Hanif. Okay, he's from structures and material option area. So these three lectures, uh, inshallah, will be before the break. And then there will be a uh, break for lunch from 12 to 13.20. Uh, and at 1.20 p.m. we will uh, we'll, uh, resume our, our, our uh, forum. And uh, then after the lunch, there are three lectures. Among those three, the first lecture will be the determinants, the determinants of consumer acceptance of autonomous vehicles, a case study in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, to be del delivered by Dr. Ibrahim Al Saghan, who is from uh, faculty from the transportation engineering option area, and that will be followed by uh, evolution of hyperalkaline cementitious composite utilizing the high volume cement waste derived portland, uh, portlandite that will be delivered by Dr. Sahid Adi Kunle. Uh, he is the faculty member from Structures and Materials Option Area. And the last lecture will be on advances in wastewater treatment using iron-based technologies to be delivered by Dr. Haytham El Nakar. He is the faculty from Environmental Engineering. So we have tried to accommodate the, the, the lectures from each of the four option area, inshallah, Lazim. And as I said, before I will give floor to Dr. Ali, uh, inshallah, uh, the forum with more research-oriented topic, inshallah, will be continued very frequently in coming future, inshallah. So uh, I have not received any question. So now let me give the floor to Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, now you can you can share. Let me give you the... One second. Okay, now you can share, Dr. Ali. Yes. Uh, you can share your screen. Go to the, you have a green icon on the, okay, just click it. So you have it now? Yes, we have now. Go ahead. One second. Okay. Uh, one second, Dr. Dr. Ali, uh, as I said, one of the senior most faculty members uh, in the Department of Civil Engineering. He's the associate professor. Uh, he has been teaching uh, many courses, graduate and undergraduate courses in many areas of structural engineering. Very down-to-earth teachers explaining the things uh, in a very nice way. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have attended his lectures. I hope he, inshallah, you will enjoy uh, his, 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 his lecture. So, Dr. Ali, thank you very much. Kindly proceed. Salaam alaikum. Thank you very much, Professor Shamshat. Uh, really, I would like to welcome all of the participants uh, today. And I think uh, Professor Shamshat paved the way for me to, to just continue his contribution uh, in this forum. So the title of my speech today will be Attributes of Civil Engineering Profession to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We'll talk about uh, past, uh, present, and future. So basically, uh, for those who, who doesn't know about civil engineering, civil engineering is not only a building that we see, and it's not only a road that we uh, go through, or it's not the water that we drink. There are many, many options in civil engineering. And uh, this is a good name, civil engineering, without it, we didn't have this civilization. So basically structure, geotechnical, as you can see, water resources, transportation, construction, land surveying, environmental, 
and material developments. All of this is encompassing yeah. the civil engineering. Thank you very much. So nice of you. Thanks, 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 thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks. So basically here, before I talk uh, about civil engineering, and I will show a lot of structures, a lot of building, a lot of achievement, I cannot, uh, we cannot claim all the credit as civil engineering profession, but there are many partners with us. So when we say that this is contributed by civil engineering, so we don't want to make electrical engineer or mechanical engineer angry onto that, but they contribute also. So our partners into our success is electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, software developers, university researcher, environmental engineers, contractors, and material supplier, architects and architecture engineering, and also entrepreneurs. So all of this really contribute to uh, our advancement in civil engineering and make our life easy to handle. So this picture here, it can tell you that we are not only constructing, but also we are repairing and retrofitting. And we have to be careful for the environmental uh, loading like earthquakes and other things. So let me talk about the past because this is talking about the kingdom here. So what it was in the past, what it is now and what it would be. In the past, and I think I'm a good person to talk about that because it's I'm more than 60 decade. So uh, it's the past, I have been seeing all of this. I, I lived in such houses from mud, it's load bearing and uh, you can see uh, how thick those load bearing and it is made from local material. This picture is from Riyadh 60 years ago. Uh, I wish I had one in Hassa. In Hassa, there are also similar, similar building. This is Dar'iya, of course, this is how it was. You can see the same form, the same material. And we lived peacefully into these houses. They have our memories. Uh, so, and even, even the roads there, when even there is a, the petrol came and we have pavement, we are in the beginning walking or driving in two lane. And, and it's only two way traffic, two lanes. One is going and one is coming. And this is susceptible for accident and things like that. In fact, I have witnessed so many incidents in front of my eyes in the olden days because we don't have many road network. Okay, this is also another picture uh, from Jeddah and you can see it is the same mud, the same uh, load bearing uh, walls. Then suddenly we have the brick walls. So now we are moving slowly, but still we are still talking about the past. And this is load, uh, this is brick walls. So you can see now the wall thickness is smaller because the bricks is higher strength. And then concrete, the conventional concrete come into existence. This is now reinforced concrete and it came with its own problems. Of course, the ordinary concrete and that at the time I was a student here, everybody, even the contractor, they talk about 3000 PSI, like this is a magic number. FC prime is 3000 PSI. And there is a problem with that because of honeycombing and it is porous concrete. So we have a lot of problem accompanying this conventional concrete, which is 3000. But people here, researchers, they cannot look at the problem. They have to find a solution for it. And then we have the installation of the formwork, the curriculum, is very old in civil engineering. Now it is changing. We have CX, we have to accommodate so many things that goes with the technology. I just remember many courses that I took at that time and it was just like cocktail from different option. You take one course and there is not too much technology. But this is very important. This picture is very, very important. Since I, since I was a student, I, which is about 40, 50 years ago, Corrosion is a big problem in this area here. And because they are using uh, uh, conventional concrete, low permeability, it's not dense concrete. And most of the research was about how to avoid this problem. So rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, to think about something else about the concrete is how to protect concrete. It's cosmetic about how to, uh, Coat concrete. So most of the research 
In the 80s era, it has been in durability of concrete, including chloride-induced corrosion and sulfate attack. So you can see in the literature, there are hundreds of research into this area and contribution of KFUBM cannot be denied on this area. Then you cannot just talk about this, you have to think about other things. So now we are moving into the present. So from FC prime 3000 to different concrete, suddenly we have a leap into concrete industry and into research. So we have going through three kinds of concrete, which is really, they are super and they are coming one after another. The first one is self-compact concrete to avoid honeycombing, to avoid all the, uh, the congestion uh, when you have steel, too much steel. So this will go, it's just like a fluid basically. Then we move into high performance concrete and ultra high performance concrete. And without this, we wouldn't have seen all these subscribers. Uh, you see these, those high building, high tall building, they are demanding good concrete, high strength concrete, pumpable concrete. We need to pump concrete to maybe a uh, hundred story building. So this is the kind of concrete we have now, living it in present, self-compact concrete. And you can see it's just like a liquid. You just pour it and you don't have to worry about honeycomb or anything else. And slum has been changed from the height of the cone to the diameter of the pipe. So then this is, it's good. This self-compact concrete is good and it's flowable and it's good for the uh, columns and it is good for the earth work. You can see you just pour the concrete here and it will be good. Then now we move from self-compacting concrete to high performance concrete. The high performance concrete you can see here, it is good for the bridges and tall buildings. And you can see some of the properties here the strength. So now we're not talking about 3000 PSI, it goes from 70 to 140 uh, megapascal. So this is making our life easy, elegant, our dream can come true. We can really uh, uh, build any structure with that uh, high strength concrete, durable and fast strength. Then lately we came through the ultra high performance concrete and uh, our department is very, very uh, distinguished into this. And every day they are making a lot of contribution into this ultra high performance concrete. And I think there are many surprises in the way, but they will come in the due time because uh, research is fully devoted about the ultra high performance concrete. And you can see here, it can go up to FC prime 29,000 PSI compared to the conventional concrete, which was just 3,000 PSI. Not only the strength we talk about here, we talk about durability, we talk about sustainability. It is very, very strong and it is sustainable. It is long lasting and it gains strength very fast. Civil engineering is not, as I said, is not only to make a building, but it's actually to take the soil, which is weak and try to strengthen it. And you can see here, we are improving the soil. We do, we have piles here to uh, transfer the load to the uh, good layers of uh, uh, foundation. We have contribution into the steel structure, not only concrete, you can see here, precast, we cannot talk about construction without talking about precast and pre-stress concrete. This is all advancement in concrete. And you can see this is already done in the factory and we just assemble it in the site and its quality and the workmanship is very, very well controlled. So you can see this, some of the picture of the precast. Okay, I think this picture, I didn't need to talk much about it. You must uh, have passed by this. This is basically Ithra. This is the construction of Ithra. It is made from, this is the construction. I, I, I didn't bring only the picture on the upright because you are engineer. So I have to show this picture, which is the detail of construction. But you see how elegant it is on the top right corner. It is masterpiece, really, this King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture. Who did it? We cannot claim it's only civil engineers. Civil engineer, architects, architecture engineer, electrical, mechanical, all they put their hands together. So the, the credit, we share all the success and the credit. This is, look at these roads now. This is some of the roads in Riyadh. 
we are living this era where we have expansion and everything, you see? Now you, you've been hearing about the Metro, Riyadh Metro and how it would transfer the city to a very uh, neat and convenient transportation and uh, uh, the pollution is less and it is, it is very promising project and it's ongoing project. This is here King Abdullah Financial District. You can see how fancy, how, how beautiful it is. It's just unbelievable. And now anything that you can think of, you can make it. And the credit will go to architects, civil engineering, architect engineering, whatever, all the disciplines. You see how it looks? This is how it looks, King Abdullah Financial District in Riyadh. Who made it? Civil engineering. Civil engineering and other discipline, really, they claim the credit. Now, recently, the road between uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Oman, now we are linking the countries together. This is civil engineering. You talk about pavement, the kind of pavement, the material that we have, okay? So this is all contribution of civil engineering. Mecca, the two holy mosques, the expansion of the two holy mosques, there are many, many projects going on. It is civil engineering. Without civil engineering, without dedicated civil engineering, we wouldn't really make this possible. So you can see, you can witness the contribution of civil engineering in the kingdom uh, that we live in, <laughs> including our territory, King Fahd University of Petroleum Minerals. You see, we're proud. This is a stadium, King Abdullah Al Johara International Stadium. It's just unbelievable. It's just like masterpiece. If I give it to you without saying the name, you would believe that this is just something. It's a gift. You wouldn't believe that this is a stadium. It's really unbelievable. Okay, airport, we build airports, civil engineer. We make dams, we reserve the water, we use the water and energy. We also make ports, delivers, you know, this is how. All of this is done by civil engineering, the port, the water, the wave, water desalination, the water that we drink. So you can see the list is so long, name it. All of this is the contribution of civil engineering. And this is existing in Saudi Arabia. This is what we see, this is in Jubail. So now we want to talk about future. Now we get you some picture about the present. The future, whenever you talk about the future, you cannot talk about future without the vision 2030 coming into uh, your mind. This is where you have to align everything you are doing now for the future. It has to be aligned with this vision of 2030. And basically I can summarize three areas where we need to focus on. First, we have to focus in the renewable energy and other sources of energy. We need to focus on tourism because tourism really this kingdom of Saudi Arabia is picking up tourism. And you know, Al Hassa is considered one of the tourism internationally now. We have to talk, this is even Professor Shamsha talk about it, about the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Really these things, we have to bring it to civil engineering. We cannot say that this is not our area. We have really to know how the artificial intelligence work and the machine learning. Okay. Now, to exist in this world, which is always developing, I would give some recommendation, which is very, very important. And I would think it's from my own experience. I'm thinking that for sustainability of civil engineer profession, we need to conduct research at the nano level. Really, we have to go to a nano level so that we understand what's going on from very, very micro to macro. We have to talk about, we have to include the bio concrete and the self-healing concrete. The self-healing concrete is very, very important, okay? And this call for interdisciplinary area. We need to talk about machine learning and artificial. We need to understand the background of machine learning and artificial intelligence. We cannot say that this is not my area. You cannot put boundaries between the areas now. Everything you have to know something of everything. We need to interface with material science and researchers and chemists, because even the concrete that we have, most of it is coming from chemistry. 
It's not. We produce, we, we, we cocktail so many things. It's just like pharmacological now. It's becoming, okay? Attainment of good knowledge in programming and logic. We have to go back to on, not only using software, but we have to know about the logic and programming. Programming is very, very essential. Okay, nobody would believe that these two pictures are made from concrete. This is concrete. <laughs> it's not ceramic. This is the ultra high performance concrete. It can give you a shape like this. It's so amazing, unbelievable. This is also ultra high performance concrete. Now, Neom, Neom is calling, I think, thirsty for this kind of ultra high performance. These high rise buildings, those promising uh, challenges and dreams cannot be fulfilled without the contribution really of civil engineering. We have to take part into the future Neom. This one here is the Red Sea Development Project. And you can see in this Red Sea Development Project, there are robots going around. We have to consider the robots. We have to understand the basic knowledge about robots. This is the world most ambitious regenerative tourism project. And you will be surprised that one of our faculty, one of our faculty is working there. This one here, King Salman Energy Park. This is energy. You are talking about energy, which is an upcake. This is, this is a very promising project, the Spark. It is calling for hand in hand of civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electric, all we have to put our hands. It's very, really very, very gigantic project. And it calls for very, very uh, self-development of materials and uh, many things. So I don't want to take too much because you see, I have to keep things for interaction because I don't like to, to, to just continue talking to you. I'm just trying to bring about what you are thinking and we need this kind of interaction. In conclusions, in conclusions, knowledge. Knowledge may seems to have an expiration date, just like any a comedy. This is very, very important. Having a degree, it doesn't mean that you can live with that degree forever, no. Knowledge may seem to have an expiration date that it may turn to be obsolete. Thus, it is required to be updated to accommodate new developments to match the ambition of our country. It's very, very important. A day, this is really, this is what I extrapolate really from the advancement of material, I extrapolate this second point. A day may come, I don't know, I may be right or I may be wrong. A day may come that we may not be using reinforced concrete. And instead, we have a composite material that is stronger and corrosion free due to its own unique characteristic. So instead of dealing with corrosion, why corrosion happen? Now we may have different, completely different material with the new material that we are discovering every day. The third point, which is very, very important, and I find it, it is useful, and really I apply it in my life. A long life self-learning attitude should be the shadow that accompanied every civil engineer. You see, you get the degree, but still you can teach yourself. You can learn a lot of things in order to sustain and in order to contribute. So I will read this again. A long life self-learning attitude should be the shadow that accompanied every civil engineer to meet and adapt to continual changes and development. This is the only way to survive in such environment which is developing every day. Every day you wake up on something in a discovery. Okay, multidiscipline, which also the university has realized this and I think they made transformation of this university. Multidiscipline is a must not only within the department, but within other fields of engineering and science. <laughs> That's why the civil engineering moves to another college. Maybe this is, uh, it's meant that way. Robotics, robotics is a growing in demand for future and civil engineering. So robotics is, we have to talk about robots. This is the future. I mean, no way now we cannot, hide our uh, face. 
robotic is growing in demand for future and civil engineers have to take part into this, including the 3D concrete printing. The 3D concrete printing, it is operated by robots. And as Professor Shams said, we supply the ink and then we let them go. Now, the last thing, the last thing also, uh, Professor Shamshad touched upon this in his presentation, the entrepreneurship uh, is very, very important. We discover so many things in our university, but this has to see the light, has to go into the market. We need to commercialize these ideas of civil engineering, and we need now investor really, so that we support, they support our idea, and those ideas see the light. These are some of the things that I try to have it in my presentation. And I think uh, I'm really uh, welcoming any interaction for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for such an excellent, very nice presentation. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, thank your you. uh, your effort deeply appreciated. Uh, thank now you. this yeah thank you. so now this is the time for taking the questions you can raise your hand and i can give you access to talk uh, my dear participants uh, please you can chat or raise your hand let's let's have we have enough time uh, before we can start the next lecture at least we have we have 15 minutes so it will be nice if we we make some discussion okay I, I have, I can see some students here. Right. Please, yeah, raise your question. Abdullah al Sagi, Ahmed al Gamdi, and others are there, you know, the, or, or our colleagues are there. Please raise Very your, good. Yeah, involve yourself. I can, anybody who wants to speak, please raise your hand. I will allow to talk. Any, any just Khalid Mahasin. Mahmoud Nasr, so many students are here, and Very lab good. engineers also. Yeah. Muad so we'll Ghazi. start. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. Professor, uh, Professor Budavi, would you like to speak? Hello. Okay. Okay, uh, somebody has, okay, Dr. Mubassir. Okay, go ahead. You want to speak? Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Ali, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I just had uh, a quick uh, a query from, from what you have presented, uh, what we are looking from past, current and future perspectives. You know, uh, we are always talking about sustainable and uh, eco-friendly uh, construction materials. How do you think that the Saudi Arabia has succeeded in this uh, very pertinent and important research area from your experience? You mean the material advancement? Yes, uh, from the perspective of how sustainable our design practices are and how sustainable our materials are from the future perspective. Yeah, I, I would think uh, still really uh, material, no matter how much uh, strong the material, how much characteristic of this material, at the end, it is how this material is handled in the site, how it is built. So really the quality assurance, the quality control has to be part and parcel of the package. It is a package actually. It's not only the material, but it goes from the beginning to the, to the end. <laughs> Just like delivering a baby, this baby will not live if it, you don't take care of it, if you if you don't have it, if you ca cannot give it the, the, the right protection and things like that. Same thing with material. But mashallah, in, in our university, I think uh, we, we make so many development in the material and we are going with the trend globally. And I think Professor Shamshad, he, he, he knows that. But the only thing we need to see that the product that we have here they have to receive it. We have to encourage the industry to uh, talk about it, even in small YouTube, a small, uh, uh, we, we need to put it in the media that this concrete is available. And it's, it's not only, uh, it may cost in the beginning high, but at the end, it would be very sustainable. Yes, yes, yeah. true. 
Thank you very much for your question. It's very, very uh, important. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I encourage uh, another question. It's, it's, it is really very interesting if we are discussing after the lecture. Please, uh, our colleagues, I, just raise your hand, please. Dr. Khalid, I see any, anything you have. Dr. Hussain al Ghetani, mashallah, Professor Swayan, because this talk was in general. So any, the faculty member from any discipline uh, can, can, can ask the question. Let, let's involve in discussion a little bit. Any, anyone? Dr. Salah is also there. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, one second. So let me Dr. allow. As Dr. Asad, he is raising his hand. Dr. Uh, Dr. Asi has, has raised his hand? Okay. Yeah, Dr. Now Asi go Asi. ahead, Dr. Asi. Dr. Asi, you can speak now. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Dr. Ali, for this nice presentation. Uh, I thank don't you. have any questions. I didn't raise my hand. Thank you so much. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, Dr. Asad, Dr. Asad, Hanif. Dr. Asad, Dr. Asad Hanif has raised? Okay, yes. Okay. Okay, one second. Hello. Yes, Dr. Asad, you can, you can, you can. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Ali Al Gadib. I am yeah. really delighted to see this whole presentation. I would let, uh, just like to add one comment. Uh, you mentioned in the conclusion that a day will come that the reinforced concrete will be replaced by some composite material, which is corrosion free. I think that time is very near. If you see the development of strain hardening cementitious composites and the, that engineered cementitious composites. So that time, I think that is very, very near. We are just moving towards that particular uh, in, the, in the same direction. And if you look around in China and USA, there are great developments in this area. Even uh, now, some parts of the bridge decks, bridge, bridge slabs, these are even replaced uh, with this, uh, the engineered cementitious composite. So just we need to focus more on the ductility and the uh, strength as well as the corrosion part. So I, I hope that in near future, maybe we will be very successful in eliminating the use of conventional steel bars. So I just wanted to add it so if anyone wants to discuss or something. So thank yes. you so much. Yes, thank you very much. I think I think you are right uh, because even even this concrete uh, that we have with these fibers there, even we can use non-metallic fiber. I mean, you cannot talk with with high strength, and therefore uh, now even somebody might claim that with with uh, with the they are using stainless steel fiber. They are using something non-corrosive, non-metallic uh, fibers. And the, the, the good part about it is that this fiber will bring high ductility and high tensile strength, which means this is why you are using basically uh, steel in the conventional uh, uh, concrete because it's weak in tension. But if you have the material that is good, that is very, very high in compression and that can sustain the, uh, the tension required in design, then that's it, we, we didn't need that. And I made this because I'm assuming that the audience will be even outside the university, that they will be surprised. Oh, how, how come? Are you sure that we don't? Use yes, that? absolutely. That's why I, I, I just put it there. But definitely research going on. And as you said, it is in the near, near, near future we'll have it, right? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, Dr. Bhora, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Yes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu Professor Bhavra. Dr. Ali, I must acknowledge that we are thankful to Allah Azawajal for having Thank a you. faculty of your caliber with us. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, every time, at least when I listen to you, your wisdom enlightens me. You, you I'm, just... I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you what is in my heart. I you, just are so you are so humble. You are so know, humble. Every it's time. Likewise. It's likewise. Yeah. It's likewise. Really. Bro. Every time, you know, every time, really, you know, I learn something new from your wisdom, from your experience, from your knowledge, and from your sincerity, you know, ikhlas. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. One quick thing, you know, just uh, like, uh, do you have like, uh, just because we also have a lot of uh, students here, uh, maybe uh, just one piece of advice 
including myself, you know, and specifically maybe for our undergrad students, you know, like what you would tell them so that they can take it and and take it as a as a great advice for their upcoming future. Jazakallah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, this is really, uh, you're so humble to raise this question. I think you are full of wisdom, really. You, I'm the one to take advice from you, really. Uh, you've been crossing the whole world. You've been learning so many uh, 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 diversities of experience here and there. But anyway, to, to address this question, especially for engineers, and I have seen this in uh, even working outside, that having a high GPA or having a certificate or having a degree will not really enable you to, 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 to uh, reap all your dreams. But there are so, so many things supporting that documentation and that knowledge, and that is the skills. Really, students, they need to cultivate. They need to have other skills. I've seen people with really low GPA, but just because they have, they have relatively, just because they have some skills, they are much way ahead of those who has a lot of uh, uh, a lot of academic uh, achievement and uh, a lot of uh, good record in the uh, in the academic. So academic alone cannot stand. We need academic, but we need to have the skill. We need to have the software knowledge. We need to have the soft skills. You know. There are hard skill and soft skill. We need to have this soft skill because at the end of the day, you want to sell yourself to the people. You want to communicate with the people. So you need those skills also as a backbone for, uh, for, for, for your career. So this is my advice is not to only concentrate into the courses and the latter grades and things like that, but life is more colorful than uh, grades. Life, there are many, many things that you could learn yourself and you have a skill so that you can succeed in life. Yeah, now Dr. Salah Dulejan, uh, you raise your hand sometimes back. Uh, Dr. K, you can raise any, any concern. I have allowed you to speak. Dr. Salah. Can you hear me, Dr. Salah? I, okay, okay. You, you unmute yourself. Okay. Okay, uh, my dear students, please raise hello, your hand. Hello, Dr. Dr. Shamshad. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, raise your concern. Yes, yeah, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Shamshad for his energetic and uh, doing all this uh, work and presentation. Nice you. Uh, and also, I would like to thank Dr. Ali for his uh, valuable presentation. And always, he is surprising us with the new Amen. subjects and uh, his way of presentation. I always like it very much. And Dr. Ali, we, we don't need uh, to forget that the non-metallic is, it will be a big issue in the future also. Yeah. The, the non-metallic uh, reinforcement in our concrete. And sure. this, this will be a big uh, issue. And all the big companies now uh, doing this, start, they starting doing this, starting with Saudi Aramco, and most of the companies they will in the future maybe will not find the steel in the concrete. Right. Yes. I would like to add, uh, very rightfully mentioned by Dr. Salah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, in our uh, MX program, which is uh, going to come very soon, inshallah, we have kept one course on non-metallic construction materials. Yeah, this is a new course uh, being developed. So yeah. th thanks, yeah. uh, Dr. Ali, to touch this uh, particular point and uh, nice input from Dr. Salah. Uh, anything else, Dr. Salah? No, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Salah. Thank you, Bob So nice, sir. Okay. Uh, my dear student, please raise your concern. You should, yeah, yeah, somebody. Uh, okay. uh, one second, one, one gentleman has raised his hand. Uh, let me check who is this. Okay, okay, this is Dr. Salah. Uh, any 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 student or faculty member, please come on, come on. Yeah, anything, Professor Hamad. Any any question you have? Okay, Khalid Khalidasi. Okay, Khalidasi already spoken to us. 
and our lab engineers are Thank also you. with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Sayyid Imran Ali, our engineer Tariq. You, you can ask. This is open discussion. Just express your views. Still, we have seven minutes for Dr. Absolutely. Ali to be here. In, Alhamdulillah. Uh, engineer Ashraf, go ahead. Uh, engineer Abdullah Al Sage, go ahead. You should ask question, please. Okay, okay, I will allow Dr. Khalaf. Uh, you have a okay, just talk. Go ahead, Dr. Khalaf, and then Dr. Suyan. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ali for his uh, nice lecture thank and you. also for Dr. Uh, Shamshad for his effort to hold nice this forum. I have asked a question in the chat for Dr. Shamshad. Oh, regarding oh. the uh, CX and MX program okay. and uh, when at what time we know for sure that the program is running because we are spreading ourselves thin if all the uh, programs will be offered uh, in the same uh, in next semester uh, mm -hmm. because of the uh, load of uh, each uh, faculty, we don't want to assign a faculty member and then the, the, the program will not fly. Uh, okay, let me, let me quickly answer. Uh, this is very simple, uh, Dr. Khalaf. Uh, yeah. we, have, uh, we have put under the list of offering of the CX, uh, university-wide, three CX program, uh, traffic engineering, uh, climatic change adaptation and the waste management. The other two will take time. Uh, for sure, it will not be uh, offered coming fall. So out of these three, uh, your involvement might be there, uh, most probably in traffic engineering. I don't know, Dr. Saghan, coordinator of this CX program, uh, might tell you if there is any course to be taught by you. But the other two, uh, where you are definitely there in one of them uh, to teach one course at least that is not going to come uh, very soon maybe uh, coming spring inshallah we will offer okay 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 now now i will uh, allow professor mohammed al suyan go ahead prof and then Am amar qadri okay professor suyan assalamu Sh alaikum professor shabshad ali and everybody here uh, I was a little bit mad because I raised my hand several times and they were <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so sorry, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, my deep, was, my deep apology, my deep no apology. No problem, just yeah. just kidding. Uh, in reality, <laughs> I just wanted to express my thanks and uh, my uh, I'm being proud of the nice presentations here. So I think they were informative and I hope everybody outside the department and outside the university realize how good they, they are. So thank you very much and I appreciate your work. May Allah give you a reward for it. Amen, amen. Thank amin. you, thank you. Thank, you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank then you. Uh, Engineer Ammar Ghadri, please, I have unmuted you. Go ahead. You unmute yourself and speak now. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ammar Ghadri. I'm a graduate of uh, civil engineering long years back. I know Dr. Uh, Ali al Gadib. Since then, <laughs> I shouldn't mention the date, maybe. Dr. Ali, how are you? Alhamdulillah, Allah hayyik, Dr. Ammar. You were my, uh, my teacher sometime. I'm a, I'm a 1985 uh, student. Wow. I started 1985, graduated 1991. Then uh, I have a master of uh, CEM, Construction Engineering and Management. Mashallah. I'm still around. <laughs> uh, I wonder, i sorry, I could not attend your uh, lecture, but I joined just a few minutes back. But I am happy to see you again, Dr. Ali, and I heard Thank also the... Um, uh, the question is about uh, the uh, PhD. Yeah, you, 
Uh, Gadri, your 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 uh, voice is not coming clearly. Audio problem, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Oh. Uh, oh. There is an audio problem with the uh, engineer Gadri. Uh, he he's asking about PhD program, right? Yes, I, uh, Dr. Ali, PhD program uh, yes. in the non-metallic. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Ali. Yes. Yeah, you can tell about about our one project engineer Fasil so, is doing. Fasil. So, so, so ah. uh, because of the interruption in the in the communication, okay. what was uh, Professor Shamshad the question? The question he's asking about uh, any PhD uh, uh, program in uh, non-metallic uh, material, construction material. Uh, uh, the, the, I think this one is is really a PhD program. It's it's there. It is existing. The only thing is, what is the emphasis? You can have your thesis into this if you exactly. are interested in non-metallic. Mm. You can have your thesis focus this, and I will be proud to teach you before I leave this university. There is one <laughs> more year left for me. Catch me before I leave. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I would like to add to Dr. Thank Ali. you, Dr. Ali. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Gadri, Gadri, look, I, uh, we have one project right now going on, uh, headed by uh, Dr. Misfal Jahrani, our Vice President, Academic Affair. There is a big team. It's a Saudi Aramco project on uh, GFRP bars. We are exploring possibility of using it uh, as a substitute for the steel bars. So one uh, in this project, one PhD student is already doing work, right? So it, uh, the PhD program is not like uh, topic based. PhD, there is a, there is a, uh, uh, there are thirty credit hours you have to do if you join any option area, and then uh, you can make yourself expert in a particular area research wise by choosing a thesis topic. So if you join, as Dr. Ali rightly said, uh, PhD program, uh, and then you you can you can work uh, on non metallic uh, construction material. It could be in any form. It could be bar, plate. So many, so many options are there, and really, it is getting momentum. Uh, this okay. area of research. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the contact point, uh, Dr. Shamshad. Uh, the contact point. I should go to whom? To, you should. To you should Shamshad. apply. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am the contact point, and also the you can go to the website of Deanship of Graduate Studies and yes. apply. Apply for, uh, for PhD. There are all documents needed and the procedure. Uh, I see. All okay. Are, all are there. So you can apply through proper channel. And then okay. we'll review your case, inshallah. Uh, is there any question? Thank you very much. You, you Thank you very much. You're you welcome. Thank Salman. you. Okay. Thank so you, any, Dr. Any, Ali. Any question? Yeah, Dr. Ali has, has another two minutes. Another two minutes. So any quick question? Any? Okay. Okay. Let me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Yasir, go ahead. Yasir Jamil. And then Akbar, quickly because limited. Time. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Yasser. I am now currently in Sweden. I would like to ask if you offer postdoc opportunity that based on a program you have like uh, for a certain uh, time. Mm -hmm. Which area? In, in in civil engineering, it could be like in construction management if you do so. Uh, can I give the answer, Dr. Ali? To this question, you are the one to answer that, right? Yeah, are... yeah, yeah. Uh, Engineer Jamil or Dr. Jamil, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, actually, uh, CE department, we don't have uh, construction engineering management PhD uh, program, uh, but there in our college, uh, there is uh, another department called uh, construction engineering management. There, you can try, you can go to the website and uh, you can contact the chairman of that department. And uh, you can explore, inshallah. But we have, as I said in the beginning, uh, in my presentation, uh, four option area, structures, material, environmental and water, and uh, transportation and geotechnical, right? So if any, anyone is interested in this area, can try. OK? Uh, thank you. Now, now lastly, uh, engineer Ars Arslan Akbar, please, you are allowed to speak now. Go ahead. Arsalan, please. 
You have any question? You raised your hand. Okay. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ali, uh, now the time is up. And it Thank is exactly you very much. Yeah, so you very nice much, of you. Professor. So nice of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, now let us move to our. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank Ali. you so much. Now, okay. yeah. now, now let us move to our third lecture, and uh, that is on uh, water induced degradation of weak granular soils. Okay, and uh, it is going to be delivered by Dr. Mubashir Aziz, uh, who is a new faculty joined. Uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the department, joined the Department of Civil Engineering just two months before, around two months before. Um, of course, his area is geotechnical and he is a very good researcher, has many publications in a very short period of time. 50 research, more than 50 research articles he has to his credit. Um, and he has been involved in teaching as well as consultancy for a long time in this area. I hope, inshallah, we will enjoy uh, his, his, his lecture. So, uh, Dr. Mubashir Ajit, kindly proceed. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulil kareem. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Dr. Shamshad uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak this uh, at this forum, which is highly intellectual and uh, definitely a lot of people are uh, sharing their experiences and we are learning from each other. Alhamdulillah. Um, we already had two uh, very good presentations. So I feel myself uh, like uh, a bit confused after having these two good presentations, uh, how would be my one. So let's see, inshallah. Uh, like uh, Dr. Shamshad, thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, like he said that uh, I'm a new faculty member over here and the evidence is uh, on the back of my, on my back side, you can see my shelf is empty. So that is an indication that I'm new faculty member here. <laughs> okay, so yeah, uh, the topic which I am uh, presenting uh, today, uh, maybe it's a bit specialized topic in uh, geotechnical engineering, but I will try to make it more uh, interactive uh, for the faculty as well as for the students and some graduates who are attending this presentation. Uh, why I'm going through from this topic, the main reason is that uh, in, in Saudi Arabia also, we have a lot of uh, uh, soft rocks and uh, which are actually, or you can say uh, a lot of infrastructure development going on and they are in need of a lot of uh, construction materials, especially once it comes to the fill materials for highway embankments, for uh, making some kind of uh, fillings and all these things. So the point of concern over here is that uh, I'm, I'm using the keyword as if you look at it, uh, it is... Uh, the weak granular soils. So it comes from uh, a construction material which is weak in nature and how would it disintegrate with time and how can we model it uh, through experimentation or some other ways. So that is my, my top uh, topic today. Uh, definitely I, I've divided my presentation into two parts. Uh, one part is kind of generic, uh, giving information, a brief information, a basic information to all of the participants. And the second part is quite like, I would say, very specifically some kind of advanced uh, laboratory testings on soils. And the idea to show those, some of those results is especially for the students, undergrad and graduate students who are attending this today's session, so that they can have at least, uh, they grab some idea that how can they uh, perform some experimental research and how can they present their work and how can they do some kind of uh, experimental or empirical modeling for, for their research. So that is the objective of today's talk. And um, as far as you guys know about the soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering, I would like to start with the famous quote by Terzaghi. Uh, he said that if there was no water, there would be no soil mechanics. So that's that relates to my topic as well. So that is water induced. So if there was no water, there was no Dr. Mubashir. <laughs> so, uh, I would uh, discuss some of the, the geotechnical perspectives related to some infrastructure developments as we have just seen Dr. Ali's presentation that there are, there are uh, from future perspectives, 
we should expect a lot of developments from civil infrastructure point of view and definitely that will be needing a lot of support from geotechnical engineers as well and once i say support from geotechnical engineers that refers to uh, from today's perspective that refers to the use of construction materials which are actually geomaterials. Now, I'm not referring to definitely uh, steel and GFRP and all the advanced materials which are used in the superstructures. I'm referring to the substructure. Uh, so let's start with this. Uh, uh, I'll just try to hide it. Okay. 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 So uh, if you see these two images over here, uh, I'll try to show you three concerns which uh, we are dealing uh, from construction material perspectives. Uh, the first one is, is dealing with the, the, the geotechnical or geohazards, I would say. If you look at the, the picture on your, on your left, this is about a landslide or a slope instability in uh, a natural uh, ground situations. So which happened actually in Pakistan back in 2005, famous earthquake. And the one on your right is actually an embankment constructed by weak, I would say, construction materials. They call it as uh, mud stones or, or limestones. So they have constructed this embankment through that and have experienced, uh, experienced a lot of damages, similar damages in many parts of, of Japan. So uh, why I'm sharing these two figures, because that tells us that the problems expected could be in the natural uh, slopes it could be it could happen in the in the in the man-made embankments and so even i can add something like embankment dams or even the embankments for the the transportation networks so all these things can can happen uh, then what i want to okay so uh, if somebody can uh, how can i hide this bar uh, Maybe you you can you can drag you can put yeah. uh, on the top and then go to the right, drag it to the right. It will go. I'm trying to do it, but it's not happening. Try it is going. No, Gone. It's not. And then okay. I have to I have to keep it maneuvering. Like never mind. It's okay. Uh, um, I'm sorry for that. So uh, the point of discussion over here is that normally. Uh, in our all geotechnical designs, we uh, rather in, in other designs as well, for example, if we talk about any structural design or, or even a transportation material designs, we are always referring to the factor of safety as the resisting forces over driving forces. It's a very generic definition. We Everybody knows that. The point of concern over here is that most of the times we are focusing on the driving forces, may it be geotechnical, may it be structure, may it be transportation, because once you calculate the strength of the materials, the resistance of the materials, definitely uh, we take it as, as a constant number in our design and then we proceed with that. The problem uh, which I am highlighting today is, is regarding this issue, that considering this part of the factor of safety as constant, is it a wise decision in our designs or not? Uh, definitely, uh, from today's perspective, you will see that at least as far as you are using weak uh, and you are forced to use a uh, weak geomaterials, then this is not a constant. That's what I want to go with today. So, if you see, uh, okay, let's move to the next one. So, the next concern, which is that uh, if I talk about the geotechnical risk analysis, which normally we do, especially, especially once we talk about slopes and embankments, we have normally three ways to do that. Uh, it starts with sometimes topographical studies. Uh, for this, using topographical studies, actually we can develop some hazard zonation maps, and these maps can be developed using uh, uh, the, the modern tools today we have, like GIS, like digital terrain models, and there are many more like coming forward as the, the aerial photography is, is getting more and more advanced. Uh, now there is another field which is being developed also that is called as early warning systems. Uh, it's very common in, uh, in Japan and, and uh, in, even in many Western parts of the US as well, where they, they do have a lot of issues related to this thing. So they are now installing a lot of in-situ sensors so that they can uh, uh, actually uh, have an idea or they can forecast the geotechnical failures and, and they can save human and life, uh, the, the property as well. Uh, 
The, the third method being used definitely for risk analysis is, is using numerical models, where uh, we have limit equilibrium based, we have discrete element modeling, we have finite element based models. Now, the problem with these is that uh, once you're talking about topographical studies or real time monitoring, uh, we, we are actually ignoring the detailed material characterization. The reason is very simple because we have either installed the sensors or we are having some kind of zonation maps for uh, for estimating the possible risk. So these kind of uh, investigations are ignored. Whereas in uh, these numerical models, definitely we can go to a very, uh, I would say, micro or even sometimes nano level behavior of the of the of the soils. But the problem is uh, there is something which is missing that's called as an aging effect. Or in other words, I would say, is the material property constant with time or not? So that's a big issue uh, we are dealing in. The second uh, concern I've just discussed with you. The third one is now, like uh, Dr. Ali also said, and uh, uh, some of the research topics uh, as introduced by Dr. Shamshad, that, that the, the need of the time is to, to make the structures, to make infrastructure development more economical, uh, more sustainable. And definitely once it comes to sustainable or economical designs, the very first thing you'll be looking for is, is a cheap material, or I can say the use of local materials. I'm saying a local material as a cheap material, the, the, it makes sense because all the transportation costs and the other kind of issues, they, are, they can be uh, minimized. But sometimes, rather most of the times, I would say the cheap materials would not meet the design requirements. The reason is very simple. Because if you if we look at the, how our infrastructure development has gone through for the last few decades, we have always been trying to look for the best sites. That's right. So whatever the best materials were available, whatever the best construction sites were available, they're already used. So that means now in future, we'll be left with less number of good construction sites and definitely with less uh, uh, good materials as well. So we have to think on how to improve the materials or either how to deal with the materials. So like I said, and previously discussed as well, uh, there is large scale infrastructure development, especially in transportation networks, along with the with the uh, the structural part of the building uh, constructions and so on. Uh, what why I'm referring to transportation networks in more details because you know uh, my topic of concern today is is cheap geomaterials or the fill materials for embankments. Okay, and uh, then like I said, it's always a preference to look for local soils which can be economical and which can be sustainable. Now the problem is that what we have done for the last few decades, all the experimental or even the, the, the other type of research which has been conducted, uh, the material we have been dealing with as far as soil uh, or geotechnical engineering research is concerned, it was all about conventional soils. Once I say the word conventional soils, what does it mean? It means that the particles you are, you are considering in your design, in your analysis, you are considering them as stable, as durable. And that is a very basic assumption in any kind of geotechnical analysis, you know that, that we assume that the particles are inert, the particles are uh, stable, and they are strong enough that they will not disintegrate. Okay, so that's uh, all kind of our settlements, our deformations, our movements, they are based on the readjustment or relocation of the particles. Means we are just talking about either the void ratio is increasing or the void ratio is decreasing by the particle movements, but we never think about that the particles itself can disintegrate with time and can have a, a negative impact on what we have anticipated. So that's uh, the point on the, on the right. You can see uh, the concern is that how can we deal with non conventional granular soils? Means the soils which will not be intact, which will not be stable, uh, which will have a kind of weakening processes, or I call it as a negative aging processes with time. And what I refer to as the soft rocks, because it's very common uh, across the globe. And once we talk about the local conditions here in Saudi Arabia, along with the, all the sand dunes and sub deposits and sub -mals, we have a lot of regions, a lot of areas where soft rocks are also very common. So using those materials in our future perspective or future developments of all the infrastructures would be a challenging task for, for geotechnical engineers. So that is the, the question, is that the standard material characterization approach, which is available to us, 
and all the constitutive models we have uh, in geotechnical engineering, definitely they have been developed for the conventional materials. Now, how equally they will respond to your analysis on non-conventional soils. That is one of the uh, uh, concern. So uh, another uh, thing which is important for today's perspective uh, of, of infrastructure development is that we are now moving to performance-based design, especially in geotechnical side, this is now becoming more and more uh, emphasis on, on this kind of approach where you let the structures have some problems in future. It means do not design it for high factor of safety. Already you know that uh, geotechnical engineers, they always like very high factor of safety, um, starting from two and half and so. So uh, the, the recent trend shift is that go for a performance-based design means allow some kind of, of deformation, some kind of partial failures, but definitely not on the cost of human life, not on the, the cost of a disaster. So avoiding these two, if you can make a design which can allow certain settlements, which can allow certain kind of small failures, local failures, and you can repair them, you can maintain them in future, that can uh, save a lot. So thinking of uh, an economical design from performance-based perspective is, is a very useful idea, or I would say a good idea for, 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 for civil engineers to think on. So from that side, uh, what we need to, to see here is that, like I said, uh, uh, we talk about two concepts over here, positive aging and negative aging. Definitely aging means the time effects on the material properties. Uh, it may be strength, may be stiffness, so uh, what, as far as we know, for concrete, for steel, for transportation, there has already been this idea incorporated. We know that the concrete materials, because of uh, some kind of, you, you say, uh, salt attacks or some kind of corrosion in the steel and uh, some other kind of permeability issues in the concrete, all these kind of things, even the environmental impacts on the concrete. So even the same thing goes for the asphalt. So they have been doing this kind of involvement in that. So this was already there in, in other parts of the materials. The problem is that uh, when it came to soil or geomaterials, most of the engineers, they have always been thinking on positive aging. What does that mean? They, they always believe that once you have compacted or placed a material, maybe a uh, uh, kind of a below a foundation or behind a retaining wall or whatever. So we assume that the soil with time is gonna get consolidate. And as it consolidates, it's gonna strengthen. It's gonna improve its strength as well as its stiffness. We call it as a cementation. It can be a local, uh, or you can say on a geotechnical time scale. Sometimes it can be on a geological time scale, means talking about hundreds of years. The problem is that we seldomly or rarely think about this part in geomaterials. Although uh, in our designs, we do have that the soils can weaken with time, but that weakening process is the weakening of the, the complete soil phase system. It's not about the soil grains. It's about the system itself and how it degrades with time, how it weakens with time. Maybe it relates to sometimes volumetric expansions. Maybe it relates sometimes to development of shear planes or fissures or joints and cracks and so on. But that is again, not to referring to the particle itself. The assumption, main assumption is the particle is stable, okay? So that is what I want to uh, give a point of discussion today. Like we have uh, this approach normally working with most of the geotechnical designs that then after certain periods of, of time, maybe like, for example, if we see it over here, that this is before the construction and this is kind of, after improvement, you can see, or after placement of, of some geotechnical structures, we have seen some positive aging. We have seen this, the improvement in soil properties with time, which we refer to as lithification on geological scale or cementation or consolidation on geotechnical scale. So this was a known concept. This is something which has been now introduced in our geotechnical design approach is not, uh, still it's, 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 it's at, at research phase, I haven't seen anybody still involving this into their designs that they can uh, reduce the soil properties or stiffness and strength with time and see how they, their design would work. So this is an example from Japan where they have experienced that after 20 years, what they were expecting was that the, the strength of the soil should have increased, rather it decreased. 
So that was the initiation of this type of research into geotechnical engineering that what was the reason behind it? Was it the overall change in the soil structure or something happened to the, the particle itself? So actually what they found was that an embankment was constructed using cheap mudstone gravels available over there. And actually what happened was that this kind of phenomena, which we call it as a submergence induced or slaking induced or water induced, there's so many terminologies for this. This is what has happened to, to the particles. So this is where the research ideas came into being that let's think about this side as well. And uh, the, these are some ideas existing at that time, but the problem was if you look at into these ideas, uh, for example, if you see people have been doing, for example, this is somewhere back in 2001, but but the the concept was that they were thinking that if we have you are designing some infrastructure where the particles close to some kind of soil structure interactions are having very high amount of confining stresses, then there's a possibility that the particle can break. Okay, we call it as a particle uh, breakage. Okay, and there are a lot of theories developed for particle breakage. Similarly, um, they, 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 time, they, they made analysis of some kind of landslides where, they, where you, you, you should expect that if it's a long, a large landslide happening over a longer period of time, then it can actually shear the particles a lot. And the particles due to excessive shear strain can get disintegrated. So this kind of research was there. Even you can see the quartz particles. So quartz is assumed to be a very stable mineral, uh, a very strong mineral in terms of the particle stability. So what they proved at that time was that particle breakage is possible. But the point is, this was a particle breakage at high confining stresses and under extensive or extreme shear strains, which is not the case always. So the point of concern, like I said, it is by extensive shearing, it is by uh, I can say by uh, high confining stresses. So now what we need to think now is that, is there any other mechanism than high confining stresses and uh, extensive shearing strains? So that is what the topic is. So we call it as water-induced misintegration of soil grains. If we look at this schematic diagram of, of a granular structure of, of, of a given soil system, you, you already know these basic terminologies of phases of the soils, but the most important thing I want to show here is, if you see, uh, we expect two types of actually, uh, I would say, cementations. What is called as a cementation, which is, we call it as an interparticle cementation. So, which can happen due to many reasons, you know that, uh, as far as some chemical concentrates are concerned in the soil. So, you can see these two particles have been, have been cemented. Likewise, a particle itself is a cementation or we speak of it as a lithification of minerals. So they are already cemented. So we, if we have something like uh, a fracturing or a disintegration starting from the inside, we'll say that the intraparticle breakage has started. And if we say that the cementation has lost, we say that the interparticle cementation has been, has been broken. So that is uh, what I, I, I want to emphasize over here, that irrespective of the bonding nature of the particles, presence of water will always play the main source of initiation for the weakening processes. And that is what was the theme of this uh, idea which I'm presenting in front of you. Um, now, I would just like to show uh, some experimental research which was conducted at the University of Tokyo uh, although I have been continuing this uh, with my grad students uh, later on as well. So uh, this part of the research, I would definitely uh, make it uh, something useful for the grad students if, or even undergrad students, if they are thinking that how can they model uh, the empirical behaviors of such kind of phenomena through experimentations. Now, I'll start with the, just to tell you that the materials which uh, were used in this experimental program were soft sedimentary rocks, which were obtained from Japan and Pakistan. You can see a quick view of these materials. And definitely you can see they have, uh, the materials selected are a blend of different natures to see how really uh, the nature, the mineralogy, uh, even the morphology of different materials, how does it impact 
the behavior under this kind of special situation. So you can see some kind of limestones, you can see even some kind of shales over here. Uh, we can see some kind of sandstones and there's a mix of sedimentary rocks uh, found in this sampling. So you can see that's me. So for, uh, for the grad students, just to tell you that the experimental studies, uh, even the model tests, uh, these kind of studies, they are never easy, may it be structural engineering, may it be transportation, may it be geotechnical. So you have to buckle your uh, buckle up and fasten your seat belts to do kind these kind of, of, of bulky jobs. So, but it's always good experience. You learn a lot. Uh, if you are just sitting on your computers, if you're just doing numerical studies or simulations, and you rarely touch and feel the materials. And whenever I say materials, it's all about all civil engineering materials, not just geomaterials. So uh, you will never get the essence of their behavior. So whenever you, you want to feel the essence, uh, the true behavior of geotechnical materials or our, other civil engineering materials, always indulge at some stage in experimental or field testing. That is always very good to, to learn. Okay, so this is an advanced soil casting setup, uh, which was, was used for this, this research. It is called as hollow cylindrical torsional shear test. Um, sometimes even if I, if I use this name in, in front of uh, people other than, than geotechnical engineers, they are surprised that how can you make a hollow cylindrical sample of almost 10 centimeter in diameter and 20 centimeter in height of a, of a sandy or a cohesionless soil. So it's, it's, it's possible um, using some suction techniques and we are having kind of uh, cell pressures from inside and outside and then maintaining these cell pressures, having some suction or negative pore pressure inside the sample, it's, it's always possible to make any kind of specimen you want. So this is kind of a schematic diagram of, of the sample. The objective to show you here is that uh, whenever you're talking about the, the testing in geotechnical engineering, um, and especially its perspective towards the performance of geotechnical structures, it is always very important that how are you replicating the stress states? Uh, how do you really apply the stresses on the soils? If you see over here, the, the beauty of this test is that you can directly apply the torque. And uh, by twisting the sample or by applying the torque, actually you can have a full control of any stress state you desire on any plane of the soil element. And that is the beauty of such kind of advanced testings. You can see um, uh, one few of the benefits. There are a lot of benefits of it. Few of them is that you can do, for example, consolidated drain tests at a constant effective confining stress, which is not possible by other simple equipment like direct shear or the triangle machines we normally have in the mature technical labs. Like I said, uh, you can apply torque. And if you want to study, for example, you know that we have barb clays, we have fissured clays, sometimes even talking about the bedding planes of, of, of sedimentary rocks. So it's good to re replicate these conditions in the lab. Uh, and especially in model testing, replication is always easy, but replicating these field conditions in the lab at experimental, uh, at, at element level is always a challenging task. So this machine gives us a kind of a provision that somehow you can test a soil parallel to its bedding planes, which is not possible by other simple equipment. And the last thing is, uh, you have seen, most of you being civil engineers, you know that uh, the direct shear test, the triaxial test, they have their limitations of applying the strains because after a certain level, the sample will actually develop the shear plane and, and you cannot further apply the, the strains or stresses on the sample. This machine, this advanced machine has a beauty that you can apply a shear strain of as much as you like. Definitely it will develop some kind of shear bandings, some kind of shear planes, but there is no constraint. The machine will not stop. It will not ask you that, okay, uh, my capability is over, stop the test, but no, you can continue to as much strains as you have. So at least you can study the behavior of soil uh, at very large strains, uh, knowing what happens at a particular level. So that's the beauty of this machine. Just wanted to give you an idea, for, especially for those who are interested in experimental geotechnical research, that these are some recent developments in, in soil testing. Okay, uh, now uh, some quick results I would like to show. Definitely my objective is not to discuss 
these results in detail that what really happened at a micro level or macro level that's that's not a point of discussion over here just to tell you a generic overall behavior so that you can get an idea that how does it relates to to the topic i'm presenting for example if you see uh, the samples which i am saturating or just uh, allowing the water to to make the sample uh, saturated before i really start the testing you can see uh, why I'm showing it over here is, is, is uh, I'm not going into the details what type of a deal this is, but just a, a generally general idea is that uh, you can see the materials, they can sometimes show excessive vertical compressions or they can sometimes show excessive vertical expansion. And that is the nature of the, of the materials. You know that, especially once you talk about geomaterials, because some of the materials can expand even. And we know the behavior that why do they expand? As general civil engineers, we know the clay minerals, especially the clay minerals from the smactite group, they can cause the vertical expansions. And if you have uh, a minerals which are stable, but they are actually, um, uh, you can say, affected by the presence of water, so they can cause a kind of huge vertical compression. So now you can, although it's an element level testing, but you can relate it to the to the real infrastructure. Just imagine you have you are having an embankment being constructed by these materials, and somehow because of the poor drainage controls, some of the material gets saturated. Just imagine what can happen to 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 such kind of cheap geomaterials i'm saying it's for the cheap geomaterials definitely for 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 stable grains we do not expect these very high values of vertical strains and vertical compression so don't expect these numbers for for ordinary or conventional geomaterials this is for a specialized case where we have a very weak or cheap materials uh, the same thing if you if you see over here this is showing us the consolidation response uh, interesting thing to see over here what i have shown to to uh, comparisons is if you look at this soil, this is uh, a conventional soil uh, used in in Japan for experimental and model testing. We, they call they, they call that as a Toyora sand. You can see it over here. It's a famous Japanese research sand, research material like Ottawa sand, London clay. You you hear a lot of, of, of common names. So interesting thing to see is once you consolidate them, you can. You, you see the red and blue lines showing you the difference between dry and submerged states. They are exactly the same at irrespective of the confining pressures. We are like definitely increase in confining pressure causes increase in, in settlements, but the behavior between dry and saturated remains exactly the same. And you can see the amount of compression you have and, and definitely uh, you as a general engineer uh, can relate it to the overall deformation of some 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 infrastructures like like embankments okay so it's very very small you can see that but once it comes to cheap geomaterials i'm again saying the word cheap geomaterials which we are forced to use in future you you don't have options for good materials so you have to use these kind of weak materials and see this is how they they, they may respond under saturation you can see the dry response you can see the saturated response so you can expect very large vertical strains which can happen okay uh, the point is you may think over here that why do we use them then if we have so many high vertical compressions the, the, the answer is very simple you are forced to use it but you now have to model it experimentally you have to go for some constitutive models and if you can anticipate these kind of movements in the field, definitely you can you can make a safe and economical design. The problem is not with the settlement. The problem is with the forecasting of the settlement. If you can forecast it, if you can involve it in your design, definitely things would be better. Um, that's what I was I was telling you that the, the granular soils, their behavior is unaffected. Uh, this is kind of a summary of showing that the soils with durable grains had almost similar response under saturated and dry conditions. You can see they are almost almost on the one one line we call it as. And if you see the materials which were made of of cheap, uh, I would say weak granular materials which were uh, which were disintegrated with time, they have huge vertical strains under saturated conditions as compared to what we see in dry conditions. So you can see they are far from one one line. I'm not going into these details because they're too much for, for this topic. Uh, just generally, you can get an idea that how the cheap materials will behave as compared to uh, a, a durable soil grains. Uh, another thing, uh, this is the 
the the stress strain response uh, definitely all the engineers uh, are always interested to see what happens uh, or, or i would say that all your material properties that the basic thing uh, the basic test you have to do is always a stress strain response to get all the strands the stiffnesses and so on again interestingly you see that once we talk about a conventional material like theora sand over here you can see the behavior remains unchanged under dry and saturated situations. And even if you see how they have uh, the strains during being sheared, they, they almost remain within a very close values of, 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 of a small values of strains. Okay? Uh, but again, unfortunately, if you see the stress and response of non-conventional weak materials, so there is a huge difference between the, the saturated states and dry states. If you see, for example, for uh, this, Dr. Mubashir, uh, just wrap up uh, so that you'll get a chance to receive the question answer. Yeah, so uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, it's, uh, it's just the uh, last few slides. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So again, you can see from the saturated and dry, there's a huge difference. And that is what uh, is, is the focus of this, this research. Similarly, I'll not go into details. These are kind of uh, results from uh, cyclic testing which is very important for uh, dynamic response analysis. Uh, I, I'll show that summary later on that you can see the clear difference between that. Finally, what I did was in this research is last thing I do want to say is it's not just about knowing that what is happening to the material, it's about the quantification and then using it into your constitutive models. So this is an approach which was used based on a very simple uh, uh, a grain size distribution before and after if you can know it somehow at different stages, then we can define some very useful index we call this as a degradation index. And then this index is actually what we use in our, our constitutive modeling or empirical models for the soil behaviors. You can see uh, I've used the degradation index to define the volumetric strains. I have used the, the degradation index to define the shear strengths of the soils. You can see it over here. Okay, and similarly, I have used degradation index to define or to, to foresee or forecast the, the friction angles of the soils with time. This is called as loss of friction angle upon submergence. And um, likewise, we can also define or use this ID, or we call it as a degradation index to, call, to get these kind of hysteresis loops, which is going to be very useful for seismic uh, response analysis of any geotechnical structures. We know that uh, this kind of damping uh, effects and then calculating the shear modulus as the shear strains are increased, all these things. So my concluding remarks uh, for today's talk is that unlike standard general soils, crushed rock fill will undergo negative aging. So you, if you are looking for a new research idea in geotechnical engineering, we have to now incorporate this idea because like I said, we are forced to use now weak geomaterials. Okay, definitely our conventional approach will not work here. And uh, a very good thing to understand from here is that we have to differentiate between particles uh, degradation and particle breakage. Because if you go into literature, you will find a lot of research on particle breakage, but that is totally different, like I said before. It is about the shear strains, it is about the overburden pressures and all these things, but it's not actually talking about the particle disintegrated due to uh, water effects. Lastly, uh, we have to develop some kind of indices, some kind of tools, simple tools, uh, easy to use by the geotechnical professionals by which they can at least quickly identify or quickly assess that how much disintegration is going to happen. Like you already have a test, you, are, you may know that slate durability test, but that is most commonly used by the, by the, the, the geologists or for the rock people, rock mechanics. But for soil, still we are looking for some indices which can define such kind of similar phenomena. And that what we try to do in this is called as a degradation index. So this is, can be uh, an easy or quick tool for, for identification. Uh, lastly, I would just like to thank uh, this forum uh, by the university as well as to the, to the administration of KEX, as well as to the administration of our college and department who gave me this opportunity to, to present my ideas and share my ideas with, the, with my colleagues and my students. And last thing I want to say is that in geotechnical engineering, the only certainty is that nothing is certain. So that's what saves us from 
uh, different challenging situations. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, now I'm open for any questions you have or any suggestions you have. Thank you from my side. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Am I am I there? You are there. You are there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought I was just speaking alone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam. Thank you very much, Doctor, for the wonderful presentation. I will go to the point of performance-based design in your technical engineering. As you are aware of the material properties in geotechnical engineering are not well known. Even though you do site investigations, because of the variation nature of the soil properties, still you will not be certain maybe at a certain location of the column or the pile what will exist. So my question is, don't you think if we go to this design, much of the money will be which would have saved the other side will be taken into maintenance? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Hassan, for a very good question. I would say uh, definitely if you read more into this, uh, what we call it as a performance-based design, uh, initially what we have started with this approach is for, especially for embankments. You know, the reason is very simple that uh, it's very easy for embankments to restore, to replace, uh, to do the rehabilitation things. Uh, we can do that. So a performance day design based approach can work for that. Uh, but like you raised the, the concern for, for other buried geotechnical structures like piles, like even the retaining systems, uh, this approach still will be having a question mark on it because uh, having the deformations of piles exceeding certain limits uh, maybe we can do it, but the structural engineers will never allow us to do that. So we have to go side by side with them as well. So this is still uh, uh, under developing stage for such kind of, of, of uh, situations. Did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. I'll make much reads on it. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ali. Yes, Dr. Mbashar. Uh, thank you for this nice presentation, although I am a structure, but uh, uh, I built uh, some houses and uh, my question here is regarding this standard granular soil and the crushed rock fell mm -hmm. uh, and the negative aging. This is a very good term that you have mentioned about that. But the idea here, this is customary. This is normally the case like in the mum area, normally the, low, the bearing capacity of the soil, which is which is having the granular soil is there, they, they replace it with the crushed rock fell, thinking that this is stronger material, so you are improving the bearing capacity. But if, if we are going to have this negative aging after some times, then we are also, uh, we, we, we don't take that into account. We just thought that this is stronger material because the rock is stronger than the soil and, yeah. and therefore so. What do you advise? What do you expect from this kind of practice if we use the uh, crushed rock fell in the, in the bed for the, for the footing? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ali. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. I, I would say it's uh, very relevant to the applied side of, of this, uh, this topic. Uh, like I said that uh, the last part of my discussion was that we need to define an indices which can foresee the, how much impact would be there on the properties of whatever material you're using. So these kind of indices, these kind of models are always all, all, all already there for other construction materials. Like you said that normally this is the practice they do is they replace them with a, with the crushed rocks. Now, if I know as a geotechnical engineer of that project that this crushed rock has an indices of zero, of 0 0.1. So I'm a very confident, uh, my, my design is very confident that I definitely I'm achieving my objective of getting more bearing capacity. 
But if I know that this material is of having an ID of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, that means after a certain period of time, this material will have a loss of strength or negative aging. Now, if I can anticipate that in my design, that's fine. If I could not, then I will be having problems with my design, with my structures. So that is the, the concern over here. And this indices can be what <coughs> calculated numerically or experimentally, or how we can get those indices. Uh, this is by by exp simple experimentation of doing uh, some kind of before and after saturation analysis of of these kind of materials. Very good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. If somebody else have any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Dr. Dr. Shantab, I think your mic is on. Yes, you're right. Any question, please raise your hand. We have three, four minutes remaining. Raise your hand, please. We, we appreciate and encourage those who are asking questions, please. That is, the, that is the main objective of this forum, so that we will understand that everybody is on the board. Please, any faculty or student? Hassan, Vini, if you can uh, mute your mic. Yeah, yeah, somebody, yeah, Mr. <laughs> Engineer Hassan Tumeni, please, please, please mute your mic. I think we are hearing some voice from your side. Anybody, anyone who can, who has the question, please raise your hand. So, okay, somebody is there. One second, let me. Okay, Engineer Yasir, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you, thank you, Doctor, for this nice presentation and uh, this quite uh, practical uh, application of geotechnical. Uh, my question here is uh, regarding the constitutive modeling uh, preparations for such kind of materials. Uh, because, you know, um, uh, most of the companies outside that are uh, building projects uh, either in Eastern province and uh, other uh, Gulf countries like uh, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, uh, some of them do not like have the utility to test these materials in the lab. So usually what they do, they do like a field experimentation and uh, then do some kind of calibration, either through Plaxis or any other advanced uh, software to calibrate their results and develop their own constitutive models, like without going to the lab. So what do, you, what do you think about this approach? Uh, is it applicable or uh, we should usually like uh, perform in detail uh, experiments in the lab rather than the field? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Engineer Yasser, it's for a very pertinent and relevant question. Uh, you see, one thing that if you talk about the, the method uh, I have presented over here is it's very simple. Uh, like a machine that I showed you is, is, is not for, for the practical purposes. We definitely, we do not recommend that for, for any kind of professional projects or real scale projects. Uh, that is for purely research purpose. The test itself to identify that how would a material weaken with time is very simple. That, like Dr. Ali's question was, was there, a very similar question was, and how to assess that. That simple test can be done at site. No, no need to uh, like bring the material to the lab. Or like you said, uh, especially whenever you go for mega projects, embankment dams, or uh, like making embankments for highways and transportation networks, you can uh, do some kind of pilot studies or small scale studies, doing some uh, model tests at the site, simple models, and then knowing the behavior and calibrating your design, like you said, calibrating your own design principles. So that is quite possible. And it, it, not, it never requires very sophisticated, advanced testing, which I've shown over here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Mubasir. Uh, one question is there. 
from uh, engineer Mohammad Khalilu'din. He has written in question answer. Uh, first of all, he has uh, he has extended his thanks to your uh, for your presentation, and then he is uh, asking a question. He is saying uh, that performance based design, where the factor of safety is taken for a spin little bit. How far it has progressed, as it might be little risky to put human lives and properties, etc., at stake. Yeah, uh, yeah. Khalil, uh, thank you very much for your for your uh, comments, um, and then uh, second part of your question as well. You see, uh, once I was talking about that performance-based design, I, I said this word that um, geotechnical engineers they always like very high factor of safety. You know that. Uh, bringing our designs to performance-based means that we are now taking a risk. And uh, that risk, like I said at that time as well, it can only be taken for a structure, any geo-infrastructure, which will not pose threats to the lives and property. You can, for example, for embankments, this approach can work. You can have settlements more than expected, some kind of local slope instability, then you can repair them, but not at the cost of the life of human and even a serious damage to the infrastructure itself. So for, for, for generic structural designs, inputting this approach into geotechnical design would be risky, like you said, definitely we will not do that. And, and yeah, still, engineer, yeah, Engineer Khalil, you can speak also. Yeah. If yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Dr. Mubashir. Walaikum salam. Yeah, so I just want to know about how far it has progressed. In uh, in nations like Japan or America or anywhere other country, in, for in example, Japan too much development yeah. on it because uh, especially uh, uh, the, the the theme of this research was also initiated from there because they are forced to use you know in, in Japan the land area is much limited as compared to their overall uh, uh, living areas so they are all having uh, mountainous rugged plains so. Uh, they are developing a lot of uh, highway embankments using cheap mudstones, sandstones, and they are incorporating all these kind of uh, performance-based designs into their embankment designs. The good thing about them is their uh, response is very quick. They, you know, they are famous for quick response. So if, if there is any kind of uh, local geotechnical failures of such kind of infrastructures immediately, uh, they can they can retrofit that and so so but still in structural engine uh, in, in, in where you talk about the the uh, retention systems piles or, or kind of quay walls and so on uh, foundations so it's it's still uh, under development. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mubashir. So nice of you for your, first of all, uh, very nice uh, detailed presentation and uh, taking the questions and uh, giving the, the, the answer in a nice manner. And now, uh, this is the time for the uh, last lecture before the break. Thank and you very much, three... Dr. Thank you. Yeah, so nice of you. Uh, and after the break, there will be, uh, inshallah, another three lecture as I announced. So now the fourth lecture is on uh, lightweight cementitious composites prospects and challenges. This lecture is going to be delivered by our faculty, Dr. Asad Hanif. Uh, again, he is the new faculty who joined last month, uh, okay, uh, our department. Uh, Dr. Asad Hanif's uh, specialization is uh, structures and materials. Um, he, he, he was a postdoc before joining our department and uh, he is actively involved in the in the research work in the area of lightweight cementitious composites, ferrocement and thin laminate, laminated composites, fracture and fatigue of composite, nanomaterials in cementitious composite, and so on and so forth. So, uh, Dr. Asad Hani, please kindly start your presentation. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shamshad. And uh, thank you, uh, Kix, for providing the platform to share our uh, knowledge, ideas, and have some fruitful discussion. So let me share my screen and then I will start. Uh... Okay, so now can you, can you see my screen? We can see very nicely, go ahead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So the today's topic uh, for my presentation, which I have selected to share with you, is the lightweight cementitious composites, prospects and challenges. 
so i will try to keep it as simple as possible and of course uh, some part will be technical so i am dr asad hanif i am assistant professor at the civil and environmental engineering department at kfupm saudi arabia i just joined uh, last month so the sequence of the my presentation shall be as shown first the introduction uh, followed by uh, excuse me sorry uh, followed by the recent development and trends then the challenges and prospects and finally the questions and some discussions so first of all why do we need uh, lightweight concrete or lightweight cementitious composites so the simple answer is of course it reduces the dead loads which leads to the smaller cross sections of the structural members as well as foundations so we have convenient fabrication shipping and transportation which is particularly uh, useful for uh, from the perspective of precast concrete and its installation and erection of the members at the site so the reduced overall construction cost is another uh, motivating factor for using lightweight cementitious composites or concretes they have exceptional durability to chemical and frost attack with lower permeability uh, lower permeability they have a uh, higher porosity but low permeability and due to the porosity they have some air voids in it due to which they can accommodate the expansion products which may be formed due to chemical or frost attack they have greater fire resistance and improved thermal insulation as well one of the most important uh, application of lightweight cementitious composites has been the thermal insulation so because of the air voids in it because of the lightweight the thermal conductivity coefficient is very low and it can reduce the uh, cooling and the heating load on the buildings which will eventually uh, help us save the energy so the aci 213 guide for structural lightweight aggregate concrete it suggests the unit weight in the range of 1120 to 1920 kg per cubic meter for lightweight concrete so concrete normally we use this term for uh, the composite which has cement fine aggregate coarse aggregate and water however in the contemporary concretes uh, or the contemporary uh, construction the composites for construction there are several composites in which we do not use uh, the coarse aggregates and uh, the main focus will be uh, my main focus uh, of today's talk will be on these composites so that's why i will not be using concrete i will be using the term uh, cementitious composites so you can understand uh, that these are can be interchangeably uh, interchangeably used depending upon the presence of or absence of the coarse aggregates so how do we make the lightweight uh, concrete we have two kinds of approaches one is we can induce a large volume of air within the concrete or we can uh, incorporate lightweight aggregates in the concrete so as we know that the aggregates these constitute uh, around 3/4 three quarters of the concrete volume is actually uh, occupied by aggregates so the the properties of aggregates these affect the properties of the resulting concrete so we have different kinds of conventionally used lightweight Uh, aggregates, or we can also call them lightweight fillers. These include foamed slag, expanded perlite, uh, expanded glass, hollow spheres, glass beads. Uh, yes, and EPS beads, expanded slate, shale clays, expanded vermiculite, etc. So now, if you focus, uh, if you look here, their bulk density is very low as compared to the Uh, natural aggregate or natural gravels or as well as the fine aggregate so this is the reason why uh, these aggregates make the concrete lightweight however if you look at the manufacturing process we can uh, quickly realize that it takes a lot of effort as well as cost and carbon dioxide emissions as well for producing lightweight concrete uh, lightweight aggregate sorry so due to this a uh, whole manufacturing process 
the cost of the lightweight aggregate increases. So which is another challenging issue in the application and development of lightweight concrete that if we are spending so much cost just on the processing and the mechanical treatment of the aggregates, so that will increase the overall cost. So, these are different kinds of uh, lightweight, uh, lightweight aggregates which are currently being used or which have been previously used. So, expanded perlite, perlite expanded polystyrene beads, formed slag, microspheres, etc. So, these are very light and but they have a uh, greater volume. So uh, ultimately our resulting concrete is very light. So the lightweight uh, concrete or uh, we, sh we should just say not just the lightweight concrete, maybe any cementitious composite, it is no longer uh, applicable for the building construction applications. There are many other applications for, and all, uh, for uh, cementitious composites. And if you see these, kind of shells or pedestrian bridges, domes, boats, even the large ships, these are made of all cementitious composites by incorporating fibers or uh, fiber meshes. So now, uh, then we come to the limitations. What are the limitations of uh, lightweight aggregates and what are the limitations of the uh, lightweight concretes or lightweight cementitious composites that are uh, the, how the properties are affected by these lightweight aggregates, which, uh, which, is a, which are some challenging issues. The low mechanical strength and porous nature and high water absorption of the lightweight aggregates are the primary factors that affect the mechanical strength of the resulting concrete, also the brittle behavior of the resulting concrete, and the, we have greater porosity and more air voids in the microstructure. Now, porosity can also be beneficial from the chemical or frost attack perspective. However, the porosity is a direct function of, uh, it, it, it is directly related with the concrete strength or the, uh, the compressive strength of the cementitious composites. So if we have higher porosity, we will definitely have lower strength, which is another problem that while making lightweight concrete, we drastically reduce the compressive strength. Greater carbon dioxide emissions associated with the production aspects, mechanical and heat treatment, as I just discussed earlier, and the consumption of natural resources compromising the sustainability. These are the issues with the production of lightweight aggregates and lightweight concretes. So how do we tackle these? More recently, fly ash cyanosphere has been uh, used as a lightweight uh, filler for use in cementitious composites uh, for producing lightweight cementitious composites. It is uh, uh, obtained from the byproduct of coal uh, burning. So from the coal fired power plants, the byproducts are mainly the fly ash. So it is also a kind of fly ash, but its uh, particle size is uh, slightly higher and its weight is less. And these are more like uh, spherical particles. So their specific area, surface area is uh, also very high, 6.02 meters square per gram. The particle size gradation, uh, the particle size distribution you can see as compared to the cement particles, it is the particle sizes, uh, particle size is slightly higher. However, we use greater volume of or the greater weight fraction of fly ash cyanosphere in cementitious composite to develop a lightweight composite. So these are different uh, kinds of, uh, these are the different kinds of uh, products formed from uh, fly ash, not, not the products, but these are different types of the uh, byproduct of the coal coal burning. So in this, in this, you can see we have cyanosphere, unburned carbon, magnetite, solid fraction. So the cyanosphere, they find multiple applications in super hydrophobic surface, lightweight cement and concrete, lightweight ceramics, et cetera, et cetera. So now the further uh, slides, these will be discussing, uh, these will be uh, showing you the recent progresses in the lightweight 
cementitious composites developed by using light, uh, fly ash cyanosphere. So one of the difficulty in obtaining fly ash uh, cyanosphere is the, their separation from the fly ash because these particles are lighter and uh, their particle size is also different as compared to the normal fly ash. So from the, uh, the, from the coal fired power plants or from the coal burning, when we obtain all the waste material, actually it has different sizes of uh, fly ash particles and uh, that includes fly ash cyanosphere as well. So this is one of the challenge. However, there are methods, uh, dry separation method as well as wet separation method by which it is separated from the uh, other bottom ash or fly ash. However, these processes are still uh, a little bit complicated. So in, in the countries where most of the energy generation or electricity generation is dependent upon coal burning, so these uh, fly ashes are produced in, in huge quantities and there they have specialized processes uh, to separate cyanosphere from fly ash, which can be further used for different applications. So if we see the chemical composition of uh, cyanosphere, it is somewhat similar to the uh, normal fly ash. And from the XRD, we can see there is a broad hump, which shows the amorphous nature of this material, cyanosphere. The amorphous nature will be uh, very help it is very helpful from the perspective of secondary hydrate formation by the reaction of amorphous silica with the portlandite in the cement hydration products. This figure shows the shell thickness and the cyanosphere diameter and the pi part or the particle diameter that how the shell thickness Actually, it is the cyanosphere is in itself, it is, you can treat it as a ball, so as a shell. So the, the shell thickness and the cyanosphere diameter relation that is shown. And the uh, thicker, if the cyanosphere particles have thicker shell, so their isostatic shell strength will be higher. And the resulting concrete compressive strength or the composite compressive strength will also be higher because these particles are difficult to break under compression. So the presence of amorphous silica, it points towards the one uh, important aspect, which is the pozzolanic activity, which is the secondary uh, reaction of calcium hydroxide with the silica to make, to form the calcium silicate hydrate gel. So in order to confirm this, the thermal grav gravimetric uh, analysis was done. So which showed the reduction in the uh, Portlandite content, which showed, which confirmed that uh, the calcium hydroxide has been consumed and greater CSH gel has been formed. So this is the, these are the SCM images of different uh, uh, pastes. These are the cement pastes without any cyanosphere particles. And these are the cement pastes with cyanosphere particles. So here we can see that some of the particles remain intact. However, some of the particles, they have reacted uh, with the cement hydration products. So these, uh, here we can see that how the cyanosphere particles react in the cementitious, comp uh, in the cement composite, and also how most of the particles, they remain intact. And this is why the void content, not the void, we should not call it the void content, we should call it maybe the air content, uh, which is enclosed in the cyanosphere shells that is increased. So at the same time, the compressive strength of the resulting composite is high, whereas the unit weight uh, or the density is low, which makes it an excellent uh, filler material for producing lightweight cementitious composites. However, there are some problems with these, uh, with the incorporation of uh, cyanosphere in the cement composites. So there can, there is, of course, there is very high porosity. And these are the SCM images taken at, uh, at a later stage after 90 days age. So we can see uh, most many particles which have been uh, used, which have been con uh, consumed in the uh, reactions. And also there is agglomeration of some particles. This is some, 
some of the uh, limitations of this uh, material. However, it is not such a difficulty to be uh, that hinders its application in the production of lightweight cement composites. So as uh, shown in the SCM images, we saw that the porosity increases with the incorporation of cenosphere particles. So here is the graph that shows the uh, intrusion volume as well as the porosity of the cement composites. If you see, this is the normal cement mortar, cement paste, and this is the cement paste that contains cenosphere particles. So these uh, samples, these are actually, they contain only cement and uh, uh, cenosphere particle. There is no other uh, lightweight aggregate or gravel or anything. So in at 55% weight fraction, we have almost 50% porosity and the strength is uh, accordingly declined. So when we plot the porosity versus the specific strength, specific strength actually refers to the, it is the compressive strength per unit weight. So we can see that it is directly increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing with the, the, the poro uh, strength is decreasing with the increase of porosity and the weight fraction. This is another uh, important uh, uh, part that as we increase the weight fraction, this curve is the, the black curve is the, for the weight fraction of the F FAC incorporation level and the red curve that is for porosity. So as the FAC weight fraction increases, which directly means that the volume of cyanosphere particles in the composite are increasing, so the strength is decreasing. And similarly, so the, when the strength is decreasing and the FAC incorporation level is increasing, the porosity is also increasing. However, even though the porosity increases for cementitious, uh, such cementitious composites, the permeability uh, it has been uh, observed that the permeability has not uh, does not decline significantly. So, due to which uh, it is a it is considered that it is a uh, it is beneficial from the durability perspective. So, from the mechanical testing, including compression, flexure, or uh, tension tests, we can see that uh, at up to 1600 kg per cubic meter density, you can see that we can achieve 55 megapascal uh, concrete. That depends on the uh, FAC uh, cenosphere volume fraction as well. If we increase the volume, of course, there will be reduction in the density. However, the compressive strength will also decline accordingly. So in order to uh, overcome the brittle behavior or the brittle nature of the lightweight composites, fibers have also been earlier uh, used, different kinds of fibers have been used uh, to overcome the brittle behavior. So 0.1% volume fraction of uh, PVA fibers leads to uh, the multiple cracking behavior induces the multiple cracking behavior in the uh, such kind of uh, composites. So one important, uh, another important aspect of uh, lightweight composites is the thermal performance. That how do they, uh, how, what is the thermal conductivity and how do they perform if they are uh, used as uh, exterior build, uh, building panels or facades. So that has also been tested and it has been shown that uh, there is a significant uh, reduction in the thermal conductivity coefficient. And in this experiment, as you can see that this bulb is mim mimicking the sun and there were uh, thermocouples installed on the exterior and the interior surface of the specimen, which was just at the bottom. Uh, of this whole uh, channel, you can see. So the temperature difference between the exterior surface and the interior surface after uh, four or five hours, it was measured. And this is the curve that shows the peak temperature difference in the inner and outer surface. So with the FSC incorporation level, as well as uh, these uh, in this research, cenospheres were used with another lightweight aggregate, uh, aerogel. So it shows the 
excellent thermal performance and the thermal insulation uh, thermal insulation behavior of uh, such composites so this is the graph that shows the uh, comparison of thermal conductivity of cyanosphere incorporated composites versus uh, normal concrete or cement paste so if you see the thermal conductivity of uh, cement paste is around 2 and for concrete it is around 2.1 so these are the ULCCs, ultra lightweight cementitious composites, which have the thermal conductivity up to 0 0.4. Depending that, of course, it depends upon the volume fraction or the weight fraction of the uh, cyanospheres. So there is uh, fatigue testing results as well, which I personally uh, carried out. So these are the SN curves. So these uh, specific cementitious composites were made by incorporating fibers as well as, well as fiber meshes. So actually, when we incorporate, we, when we cast thin uh, composite sections and we incorporate fiber meshes, so that actually constitute the laminated cementitious composite. So we determined the SN curve and we determined the uh, failure fatigue lives and it was the excellent fatigue life and the durability was also confirmed for uh, fly ash cyanosphere incorporated uh, laminated cementitious composites. Now, in order to further improve the uh, properties of uh, cyanosphere incorporated composites, nano silica and nano titania were also, also used. So nano titania or nano silica, they are nanomaterials. So they have different kinds of effects in the cement composites. So as from the TEM images, as you can see that nano silica is amorphous, whereas nano titania is more crystalline. So nano titania did not affect the uh, compressive strength significantly because uh, it did not accelerate the hydration However, for nano silica, it, it not only accelerated the hydration, as you can see, we saw greater uh, consumption of cyanosphere particles. Here we can see that more cyanosphere particle, uh, more degree of consumption of cyanosphere particle due to nano silica incorporation. And also the interfacial bond between the cyanosphere particle and the cement hydration product, it was improved. So th this is one effect and another effect is the pore filling effect because these are the nanomaterials so they can also fill the pores. So due to the greater CSH formation as well as the uh, pore filling effect, we believe that the porosity must be very, uh, there must be some influence on the porosity. So the porosity was also studied for uh, such composites and we can see that there is some, these are the, on the left side, you can see these are the uh, cement composites without nano, uh, without nano silica and these are with nano silica and all are the uh, cyanosphere incorporated composites. So we can, by comparison, we can see there is some difference in the cumulative porosity of the uh, resulting composites with nano silica addition and also uh, here you can see that the critical pore diameter it is shifting to, towards the left. The black curve here that is the curve for the control paste and with the FAC incorporation and nano silica uh, addition you can see that the uh, critical diameter uh, curve it is uh, the crit critical diameter point it shifts towards the left that shows the refinement of the pore structure. However, with increase of uh, uh, Dr. Hassan, sorry to yes. bother. Uh, just wrap up, yeah, because you need ten minutes time to take the end questions. Right? Yes, it yes, it is uh, all, all, almost. Yes, it is almost finished. As you can see, twenty five slides are gone, thirty left, <laughs> five left. Sorry. So, uh, anyway, let's move further. So, not just the laminated cementitious composites. We have uh, double skin tubular columns as well as. Uh, sandwich structures made of uh, cyanosphere in uh, uh, fly ash cyanosphere. So I will quickly move to the ch challenges and prospects. 
So utilization of cyanosphere and thermal insulating concrete and composites uh, or coatings, it can significantly reduce the cooling or heating load of the buildings, which can help in energy saving. Another aspect, uh, research area which has not yet been explored is the micro encapsulation of F FAC particles to use as phase change material. We can uh, incorporate some phase change materials because these are uh, these can act as the carriers of phase change materials, and they can be then incorporated in the composites. Incorporation of cyanosphere with other lightweight aggregates, FAC utilization in reinforced concrete, ferro cement, and laminated cementitious composites. However, with the uh, complexity and the costs involved in separation and processing of cyanosphere from fly ash, that is a challenge. And also the durability and the long-term performance evaluation has not yet been uh, thoroughly conducted. So these uh, areas should also be explored. So that is it. So now I will take some questions if there are. Uh, Dr. Shamshad, you are mute. I'm Please sorry. Mute, yes, I'm, yes, yes. Uh, 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 thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, you have you have prepared well, mashallah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, deeply appreciate your efforts are deeply appreciated and very nice presentation you had. Finish on time. Alhamdulillah, this is the time for now question answer. Uh, I I would like to encourage all the attendees to raise the question. Please raise your hand. Okay. And uh, then I will I will uh, I will allow to speak. Inshallah, please let's entertain the question answers session. We have ten minutes time. Kindly go ahead. Yes, please. J just raise your hand. I I will just I will just allow you to speak. No question? Yeah, the, okay. When there is no question, Any, actually uh, it is said that there are either the uh, participants understood each and everything or, not, or not they, and they understood nothing. nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Hamad Khalid, you have any question? Anybody? Dr. Sahid Adi Kulli, Dr. Alausta. Any structures, material at least? Any student? I think we all are hungry. Yeah, the lab engineers, please kindly go ahead, ask the question. Yeah, we'll wait for a few more minutes. Uh, you close your, uh, your emails are visible, yeah, Dr. Hanif. Okay, so I'm sorry. Yeah, just hide it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so now it's okay. Yeah, sorry. just wait. Yeah. I forgot that my screen. No problem. No problem. No problem. Can I have a question? Yes, sure, of course. Sure, sure. Go ahead, please. Uh, just, uh, it's not a question, it's, just, it's a general uh, concern. Normally, you know, we call fly ash as a, as a, as a partial replacement of cementitious materials. But do you yes. think uh, fly ash, from its starting from its production point of view to finally using it in concrete, uh, does it remain uh, eco-friendly material? I cannot uh, comment on the life cycle because I I have not studied about the life cycle assessment or the overall uh, performance during its lifetime. It is considered eco-friendly from the perspective that it is a waste material. It will end up in the landfill. So it is better to use in concrete and also it will replace some part of the cement. But I'm not sure that uh, how the long-term performance can it can govern or it can dictate the so uh, eco-friendliness. That, that means it can be a good uh, even research area that to see its uh, that, yes, from that, life that, cycle perspective. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It, it must be explored, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very yeah. good question, very good question. And okay, uh, please, please ask questions. Still, we have five minutes time. Go ahead. Dr. Salah, you have any question? Hello. The other PhD students should ask the question. It's a very good area. 
the concrete lightweight is still very strong and durable. No question? Okay. That means there is no questions. Fine. Thank you, uh, Dr. Asad, for uh, once yes, again. Thank uh, you. Yeah, now uh, there will be a break up to 1.20 p.m. So, inshallah, uh, we will resume our uh, discussion forum uh, at 1.20 and we'll have three lectures. Let me, let me once go through these titles. Uh, the first lecture after the break will be uh, the determinants of consumer acceptance of autonomous vehicles. A case study in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Second lecture after the break will be evolution of hyperalkaline cement. It is composite utilizing high volume cement waste derived portlandite. Uh, and the last lecture uh, will be on advances in wastewater treatment using iron based technology. So these are three interesting uh, uh, talks in three different areas. One is in transportation engineering. Another is in, in materials, structural materials. And the last one is in, in environmental engineering. So I, I do expect that the, the number of participants will rather increase, inshallah. Uh, we, we will attend again with the same spirit, same interest, and, and we'll, we'll ask questions to, uh, to the speaker. Okay. So thank you very much. Let us, uh, let, us, uh, let us stop now and resume at 1.20 p.m. today. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Auzu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. On behalf of the CE department, again, I would like to welcome all the attendees uh, uh, to this forum, CE department forum. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we had very good uh, sessions uh, before the lunch. There were four sessions, and uh, we were really delighted to, to have. Uh, uh, good number of attendees and their uh, questions and very good presentation made by the speakers. Now, this is the time for uh, the first lecture among the three is scheduled uh, in the afternoon session. The first lecture is, uh, the, you can see on the screen, the determinants of consumer acceptance of, uh, okay, it has a little bit change. Uh, okay, no, no, it's the same uh, acceptance of uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, a case study in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And this uh, uh, lecture is going to be delivered by our uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Al Saghan. Dr. Ibrahim Al Saghan um, uh, is the assistant professor in the CE department. I could say uh, a senior assistant professor, mashallah. And uh, he, he did his PhD from USA, BS and master from KFUPM. And his area of concentration is traffic engineering mainly and uh, he has kindly agreed on 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 having this talk so uh, let's uh, let's welcome dr ibrahim so dr ibrahim now you can start your uh, lecture thank you very much thank you thank you thank you dr. Shishad, for uh, mr chairman for introducing me and i would like to welcome all the audience and thank you to give me your, from your time to um to present this um research, recent research that has been published. Um, first of all, this research was um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Renib. Uh, he was like our, uh, one of our PhD graduates here and he's um, a professor now in uh, University of Bahrain. Um, Dr. Uh, Khaled Asi, who is also an assistant professor here in uh, KPM. Um, Mr. Ghazi, Engineer Ghazi, Engineer Muhammad, uh, Engineer Osama, all of them were um, our graduate students and um, uh, during the COVID situation, we we had to do some um, some convert some training their training program to uh, to online program and um, we had a wonderful um, research that we conducted together. Um, I, I will start with uh, this um, the, this topic: the term of consumer acceptance of, of autonomous vehicles and. Um, and autonomous vehicles, uh, actually, let's start why we need autonomous vehicles. In the US, for example, there is 2.2 million, uh, million injury due to road crashes and resulting in 30,000 faculty, uh, fatalities. And also, this cost about $300 billion every year. However, 90% of these crashes are mainly due to human factor or bad driving. So 
autonomous vehicle can give us the promises of uh, eliminating or reducing human error uh, or bad driving with this issue. So um, obviously, AVs can help us to, to reduce 90% of these crashes. So most significant barrier to AV um, uh, is acceptance. And acceptance is not a technical aspect, but also um, and also include like acceptance of the driver. So um, we cannot realize benefit of, of um, rise, uh, rise the benefit of uh, AV unless the public does, uh, uh, unless the public does accept AVs and uh, does, because the AVs, uh, we could have a system of AV and manual driving at the same time. Um, if they don't accept it, um, they wanna, um, they want to use it as as we see now the injection of um, um, like uh, the Pfizer and the COVID situation. People are not do not trust these, so um, do not people do not use it. So uh, the use of AV can directly and um, proportionally related to the degree of trust expected toward it. So um, so we need to understand driver acceptance uh, to identify limitation and possible associated with these systems and predict user intention and interest and how we can um, how we can uh, make these uh, AV uh, come smoothly and implement it smoothly and in, in, in surgery especially. However, there is a lack of uh, these precise definition of driver acceptance and of a new technology. So um, there is a research by uh, Adil, uh, Adil who, in 2014, they define the acceptance of uh, uh, the concept of acceptance into five categories. The first category is the use of word accept. The second category was satisfy a need of, of uh, and requirement. The third, the sum of altitude. The fourth, the willing to use it. And the fifth, willing to pay and actual use. So, Acceptance could be divided in different things. And however, the authors have considered other, other, uh, other uh, categories like tech savvy, environmental view, and satisfy, and the safety of AV and trust of AV. So in this methodology, we have conducted uh, an online research using Survey, uh, Survey Monkey uh, that has been published in Arabic and English. And the survey have started with providing some of information about survey aim and what does AV mean and YouTube video in Arabic and in English language. So we we want people uh, who do not have an experience about or how have not know about what AV mean. We have provided like five minutes video um, explaining what does um, AV mean and uh, what's the benefit of AV and stuff like that. So then we have asked the drivers or the survey takers to about their age, if they have a driver license. So if they are younger than 18 or they do not have a driver license, uh, license we exclude them from uh, our survey. We our focus on drivers only who are older than 18. And um, then we have asking about number of years, years spent in licensed drivers, their gender, level of education, primary uh, language, and hours spent uh, driving each week. Then we have asking different questions. So we start with different categories. Uh, we categorize our question based on comparison, environment of concern. If they are tech savvy, for example, for tech savvy, uh, we have asked them, like, I often uh, purchase or pay a new technology project, even though they are expensive. Then we have asked him, I know more about other related new technology. So um, if someone is, is um, as you said, like they like technology more and we, we want to try to understand that. Then um, then we have, uh, have some question about trust and some question about willing to use. So um, one of the question uh, in willing to use autonomous vehicle will let me do other tasks like such as eating. Uh, I think driving in congestion areas uh, stressful. So this kind of question can help us understand um, they're willing to use um, autonomous vehicle. Um, then um, we had a survey and we had almost like uh, more than 500 uh, or 600 uh, participants or 500 participants. Um, 50 uh, uh, almost as you can see, only 10% were female 
and 90% uh, and or 90% were uh, male. So at that time when we conducted a survey, uh, women were just being allowed to drive and they, um, we had low number of, of, uh, of female driver at that time. Um, the question where majority scales from a to five, uh, one to five, uh, one is like strongly disagree, the five to strongly agree, um, except for the first question, we arrange them from, from um, extremely comfort uncomfortable to extremely comfortable. Uh, then we, um, when, then we have started to analyze this question. So we found the mean, we have found the standard deviation and found like number of uh, answer in each ranking, like from one to five. And um, these kinds of information is general. It doesn't provide us um, 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 a really good question or a good answer about what uh, we are seeing here. But um, when we started, when, uh, before before we analyze analyze it more, we have some question um, about what are um, we ask the participant if can rank the trust or um, or can rate the, their trust in different car manufacturers from the world. So we started from Chinese vehicles to Korean, uh, American, uh, like Ford. Um, Apple as a Silicon Valley company and Tesla and Google and Mercedes. And we asked them to run or uh, break the trust in these car manufacturers or automakers. We found Mercedes was the highest with 8% of a mean. Then the second was one was Google with 68.5. Then the lowest one, as you can see here, like Chinese car manufacturer and Korean car manufacturer. Then after that, like Ford as an American car manufacturer. So as you can see, people trust more German vehicles and Silicon Valley vehicles. Uh, as you can see, like Apple and Google have a different um, rate, like 61 and 68. However, it seems like people trust Google more than Apple. Um, then um, as you can see here, the rate here um, as a mean of a conversion between all these vehicles. Then we, we, we start to analyze uh, the questions and we start with an offer test and, and we, uh, we have performed on a test to check whether there is a significant difference in ranking among different factors related to AV acceptance and we found it is not. So um, we found that uh, willing to use was have the highest ranking and a wire trust has the lowest one. Uh, tech savvy and uh, being tech savvy and being have uh, environmental concern and conversion where well they have the same mean. So, however, in in, in a V value of T statistics, we found willing to use have the highest uh, or tick being tech savvy have the highest than uh, willing to use then trust then conversion and environmental concern. And we found that um, female. Um, are more willing to use autonomous, autonomous vehicles uh, and also have more trust in autonomous vehicles. Uh, they have more environmental concern, uh, more kind of a willing or conversion uh, to use AV compared with uh, traditional vehicles. So um, female trust more. And um, we found also um, when we try to uh, to predict, and we made uh, we made a uh, regression model of, of uh, willing to use, and we found that only um, uh, conversion and be, uh, being tech savvy and trust are the main factor, and um, we found age was one of the main personal characteristics, social characteristics that have with it. So, uh, as you can see here, uh, the the, uh, the coefficient of age was negative. So as the age increase, as the trust in autonomous vehicle increase. So what we can understand from that, that older drivers um, do not trust AV much and compared with uh, younger drivers. And um, as they trust uh, autonomous vehicles, are, they are more willing to use um, AV and as compared with tech savvy and also compared to they are more willing to use AV. Um, so then we, we, we decided to dig more, uh, not just a regression model, we did a prediction model with A and N model. And uh, we have um, divided our data, like 50% of the data for training, then uh, 25 for validation and 25 for testing. 
And um, we we um, we have used different methods um, to to analyze um, to analyze uh, to to utilize it for the A and N model. Um, we found correlation about twenty percent between the actual and predicted value, which which is kind of acceptable in A and N. Um, uh, MAB and MSC model were ten percent and point uh, three four. Uh, ten point three four percent and zero point two three for training and validation, and their value was um, uh, for MSE was uh, ten point six uh, percent and two point five for that deficit. Then we have to uh, we have calculated the ratio and importance, and we found trust, age, conversion, and tick savvy have the highest relative importance. But the, the two um, two factor that have uh, performance was trust and conversion. So, um, in conclusion, um, our study uh, our, our study have focused and investigate factor of uh, the, the acceptance of AB in Saudi Arabia, and um, the results also have indicated that AB might or will decrease the risk of crash race, and that was the belief of participant. Um, and also, they have believed that it will be with, it will enable them to reach their distance safely. And also the creation analysis have shown that willing and trust are more linked to uh, perception that AV are more comfortable and, and, uh, than convertible uh, commercial vehicles. And female um, are favoring AVs more than males. Uh, and, and they have more trust, more, uh, have more environmental concern than male and they, have, they are more willing to use uh, AVs. Also, as, as I have explained, age have, um, does affect decision to relate to the AV um, and all the rival one not. And we're not very willing to use AV. Um, the recommendation, um, we, we need more awareness, uh, awareness campaigns about to target these people, especially for male, Old male, these kind of people may not use AV in the future, and um, providing some test drive during this campaign. So um, before introducing AVs in Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> it is expected that. However, uh, I have to say acceptance of uh, of te new technology um, is not a fixed number. So um, as as you remember, like credit card, um, uh, our acceptance of credit card, like. Two years ago is not the same as, as we are. So acceptance does revolve with the time. So um, it is not a fixed number. Uh, this number may change or vary uh, um, uh, with, uh, with the time. Uh, alhamdulillah, um, uh, we have expanded this work right now. Um, uh, right now, we have collected uh, some data um, with the same scope to test uh, driver acceptance in Bahrain as an extended work this paper. And also um, I'm doing right now, um, I'm collecting the data right now to, to uh, measure the acceptance, not for autonomous vehicles, for truck, uh, that one or uh, driverless truck. And as, as you know, trucks are, are bigger object than autonomous vehicles and or normal vehicles. So how, how people are, uh, are willing to drive next to autonomous vehicle, uh, autonomous truck, and how, how they can um, interact with them and what, uh, what is the minimum distance should be between two connected uh, trucks. So um, this kind of question, we, we, we were trying to answer it with this uh, research. So um, thank you so much uh, again. And uh, if you have any question, I are more willing um, to answer it. Uh, I do see, um, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So nice uh, of you, Dr. Ibrahim, for your very nice uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, this is the time for question and answer. Uh, okay, so I would like to request the attendees to raise the concern. Let's have good discussion. We have a lot of time uh, uh, remaining. Okay, we yes. have in fact 20 minutes time to start another, another lecture. So kindly raise your hands and then I will allow to talk uh, here. Okay, so please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Mubashir, go ahead. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Ibrahim, thank you very much for sharing this uh, very uh, interesting uh, study you have conducted. 
Uh, Thank you. Really, this is definitely this is the future of, of uh, the vehicles. We know that. Uh, just uh, a concern that uh, uh, did you try to explore something like? Uh, definitely, you have gone through from extensive literature review while going through this kind of research. But now mm -hmm. we know that. Uh, there is something uh, accident liability. It's, it's kind of a big challenge once you are going to the autonomous uh, vehicles. So yes. how would that be decided? And especially once we are having more and more interference of kind of signals through Wi-Fi, telephones and all these things. So did you try to include this in your research or try to have some idea for future uh, in, this, in this thing? Well, I, uh, different pressure. This is very, very good questions. And I think it is a research by itself. Um, yeah. uh, liability and insurance by itself. Um, still, it is in the process. But I think, I think, which as I believe, um, SAMA, which is um, um, one of the authorities and entities in Saudi Arabia responsible for um, um, organizing the insurance company in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I think, I believe, uh, but I have not seen that yet. Um, they have some uh, initiative for um, the autonomous vehicles insurance, mm -hmm. and I believe they um, they put it in uh, the car manufacturers, and um, they still they, they have some concerns. Uh, I, I do remember like my advisor back in in, in, in US uh, mm -hmm. was. Uh, <clears throat> was one of the advisors for um, um, Volvo when they developed their autonomous vehicle and also uh, one of the advisors for uh, Apple uh, when we they have started developing their autonomous vehicle before they stop it or, um, or pause it. And uh, he said like he have met uh, CEO of Ford and he asked, my professor asked um, the CEO of Ford, he said like, um, don't you regret that you have still or sold uh, Volvo to um, to to um, to I think Tata, and he said no. Uh, thanks God, like uh, we're gonna get rid of all uh, suits or uh, that <laughs> we would receive. So um, still, it is it's, it's kind of, of a concern, Dr. Bashir. Um, um, uh, still, um, all the crashes that has been reported, um, um, they. Um, they have not put anything within the system. Uh, I'm not sure about the crisis that has been done in the US and how they handle it for sure. And to give you a clear answer. But as I said, it is very important question. Nobody has answered yet. Okay. Okay, thank okay you. thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Dr. Hassan Al Ahmadi, uh, brother, go ahead. You have a question. I have allowed you to speak. Dr. Hassan, just unmute yourself and speak, please. Dr. Hassan Al Ahmadi. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as Wa alaikum as -salam. Can you hear me, Dr. Uh, very sorry. Yes, yes, nice. yes, yes. Uh, very thank fine. you for your presentation. It was excellent. It is up to date. But uh, everybody is worried around the world about these mm -hmm. uh, autonomous vehicles. It's about safety for this, for to be different to the kids, to the drivers. I mean, still now the safety is the questionable. Is there is any mm -hmm. news about the latest development in safety? And the percentage of accidents they are involved in. Thank you. To be to be to be honest, Doctor uh, Hassan, um, autonomous vehicles as as autonomous vehicles. So uh, let let me try to go back a little bit and explain what is uh, AV a little bit. So we have five range or five um, degree of AV. So our our vehicles is is one of one of the AV um, ranking. So our level what we call so um like uh abs is a kind of uh, an av system so uh we call it level two um as you can see now in in, in what you call it um mass production uh, we have land uh, land lane assistance and all these it's kind of an av system so um it is a system that can help us to uh, negate or maneuver our vehicles inside the road so um until we reach what you call the homeless vehicles in a mass reduction, we have not reached it. And um, to to say to say that it is safe um, until now, we cannot say it is one hundred percent safe. I believe there is a lot of scenarios that has been concerned. Um, uh, one of the scenarios: what if um, the camera have uh, have dust or has been blocked, or the radar have dust or has been blocked? What happens? Uh, yesterday, I have seen uh, a video by uh, Volvo. 
um, they um, be kind of like having a hidden hose that come to uh, to spray water on the camera so it's gonna be clear all the time uh, to, to clean these cameras. So um, these kind of things, they are thinking about it um, and uh, how they gonna handle it in the future. Still, we are in the process. We still, I believe we need to, um, the avias companies need to come to the Gulf area and experience uh, the environment in, in Saudi Arabia, experience the dust, experience if there is a camel in front of you, uh, I'm sure they have not practiced camel. They have practiced deers in the US, but but they have not practiced camels. Uh, <laughs> okay. And yeah, so these kind of questions need to be answered. Yeah, actually. Yeah. There is a student, uh, engineer Mohammed uh, Balugan. I allow you to speak. Go ahead. Put your yes. question, Mohammed. Mohammed Balugan. You can, huh, okay, go ahead, Muhammad. Hello? Muhammad? Yes. I hear you. We can't hear Please. you, Muhammad Balogun. Can you, you unmute mind? yourself? Yeah. Uh, he has unmuted. Uh, he has speak has out, unmuted. speak out, please. Okay, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim, his question yes. is, does issues of cyber security affects autonomous vehicles? like hacking yes. and, and his hijacking of vehicle this is this ah, okay. question okay. Huh? okay um okay let's start uh, before we go to uh doctor uh big questions i start okay. with um, with uh, the hacking issue security and hacking is one of your concerns yes. and um 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 and we have some some companies have shown that they were able to hack uh, even traditional vehicles and drive it away. Um, still, it is a concern. Still, um, um, this, this to be more clear, let's go back a little bit. And what we have seen to uh, Hawaii and in the US is not a matter of money, it's a matter of security and national security. And they believe in the future, all, all the vehicles, um, not all the vehicles, all the devices are going to be connected in what we call it uh, Internet of Things or IoT. And these Internet of Things uh, will depend mainly on 5G networks. And if Huawei start to build their own 5G networks in the US, they might able to control all these devices in the future. So hacking is not a new thing. It is still in process. Security matter of security is still a process. Um, um, our, all, all of our devices are, are exposed to hacking to export to security issue. Um, will it might happen in the future? Yes. Are we um, not vulnerable to this issue? No. So it is a matter of trust and a matter of, of we're going to have um, a, a development in, 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 in our concern. Our iPhones could be exposed, um, um, but however, I, yeah. uh, our company uh, update their uh, software from time to time. I mean, we can we um, can have uh, we can have antivirus or something like that also. Yes, 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 uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah so could be having thanks. Um, uh, Hans. Now go to. Go to uh, okay, okay. Yeah, Dr. Uh, um, we 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 um, there is some initiative, but. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a small initiative. We have tried to uh, to work with Aramco, but I think Aramco are not, um, they they have something uh, other to think about. Um, um, but but in, in Saudi Arabia, the AV as a concept, AV is, there is no such initiative uh, on that. I have seen some, some work has been done in Kaos uh, King Abdullah uh, University in in in, uh, in, in, in Rabah or um, in Jeddah, and uh, they have started uh, with autonomous uh, bus system in their campus. I'm not sure how far they have going. I'm not sure wh what they are planning to do, um, but I think I think there is some work ahead. Uh, Neom as at Z uh, as it is, uh, they are. Um, I think they have started their own program. They are building the new program, but I have not seen any incentive uh, from their program yet. Yes. Okay. Uh, Engineer Beg, I have unmuted you. Uh, if you have yeah. any other question, you can speak out. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we, we can do, hear you. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, there was some issue with the mic uh, earlier. So very nice presentation. Of course, this is the future, but mm -hmm. uh, 
other countries who also tried to implement it, they have down on it. That's why I was asking, is there any initiative uh, uh, for the future over here, not uh, related to some small areas like uh, you have Neom City, but for Riyadh or for Jeddah, for big cities, is there any research at Kin or other companies who are working here? They, did they start at any work on this? You are totally right. Uh, um, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I, I do hear you. Um, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you are totally right. Autonomous vehicles could cannot work by itself, uh, yes. merely depending on, on, um, on um, their own technology. It, it does have to be connected with the infrastructure. And there is a lot of initiative in US and a lot of initiative of having a smart city in US and um, that have some devices that able to connect um, intersections to, um, to um, what we call it, autonomous vehicles. Uh, autonomous vehicle, if it's gonna depend on its GPS and its location. Um, when, as you know, if we have our phones, sometimes it's gonna take us from one street to another. So our, if I am at my home, it's gonna take me, uh, if I send my location at home, it's gonna send the location of my neighbor. But, we cannot allow this one in autonomous vehicles. We do have some devices or system that recalibrate the GPS or location of these, of these uh, autonomous vehicles. So we need to install some devices that uh, send the locations of, of uh, or send a kind of a calibration message to these autonomous vehicles. We need a, a, a device at intersection to allow interaction between autonomous vehicle and intersection. And also we could take it farther. We could take it of autonomous vehicle have violated or a vehicle that have violated um, uh, a red sign or red signal at intersection, this message could be sent out to all the vehicles, all, all autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles around the intersection to slow down, to stop, so they will not crash it. Um, uh, will that mean other question that will uh, the other drivers will try to trick the system? So um, they will not stop at intersections and because they know autonomous vehicles, they will automatically stop for them. Um, this is another question that includes also pedestrian. If they see autonomous autonomous vehicle, they start to jump because they know autonomous vehicle will stop for them. And all these questions need to be answered also in the future. Um, so yes, we need we need more study, more social study, and more and and, and also more initiative in uh, as a smart city initiative. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm not sure if I have answered you. No, no, story. very nice, okay. excellent, okay. excellent. Just beginning, inshallah, we'll be okay. Uh, please raise. Still, we have five more minutes. Uh, my dear attendees, please kindly raise your hand, and you'll get a chance to discuss. Let's have discussion. Very nice topic. Yeah. Yes, uh, Engineer Hussam Al Hijaji. Okay, yes. now you can yes. speak. I have allowed you. Just speak. Hussam? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, can, you hear? can you hear me? Uh, we can, yes. we can hear. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So thank you, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, for this presentation. But I do have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think, like, the effect of the AV on the speed? Like, if we, like, install or make 30% uh, of the vehicle in the street AV and the 70% uh, human. So is it going to affect the speed on the road? It does have, it will does have an effect. It will, uh, um, it does what, uh, as we increase the penetration of, of AVs in, in, in our infrastructure, our, in our road, uh, so we will start to have an effect. And uh, that's include um, increasing the capacity, uh, uh, increase the performance, because let's say something, uh, when we drive, and highways, uh, we are not freely drive. So uh, when I say freely drive, um, I'm, I'm saying that um, there is a vehicle that in front of us that um, are moving slower, so it will have a big, uh, or will it will affect our, our speed. However, um, um, I don't know, there's someone is not muted, so. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I think the top, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, so um, that's 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 my effect. Uh, 
how what's the magnitude of that effect? I'm not sure, Hassan. But um, different studies have said that um, to have fully effect, it's, it's at uh, like 100%. But at 30, 40, 50, we start to see the effect on capacity and, and, and the performance of the network. Did I answer your question, Hassan, or not yet? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Well answered. Any, any other, other person? Please, please raise your hand. Ask the question. It's a good discussion going on. Okay. Any, anybody else, please, in any of our students or faculty member, kindly raise your concern. Dr. Hassan Al Ahmadi, do you still have any question? Dr. Khalaf. Okay, Dr. Khalid Asi. Any question? He's a co-author, yeah, doctor, in the paper. Okay, okay, I know, I know. But still, he may, he might have discovered something. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, okay. we, we are working together in a paper right now in Bahrain. Alhamdulillah. Uh, the same topic. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, excellent, excellent. Your work, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, I don't think any there is any question. I uh, it would have been much better if if some more questions would have been raised. Okay, uh, Dr. Asad Hanif, you have any question? Yeah, okay. Okay, so thank you very much. So nice of you, Dr. Ibrahim, for your very nice presentation. And inshallah, we will keep doing, uh, keep receiving your, uh, keep having your presentation in future also. So thank inshallah. you very much, inshallah. So nice inshallah. of you. Yeah, thank inshallah. You. Inshallah. Thank you so inshallah. inshallah. Okay, so, uh, so it's, uh, it's a two o'clock, although... Although the next uh, lecture was to start at 2.10, but if Dr. Saeed, can you unmute yourself, Dr. Saeed? Dr. Saeed Adikulle? Hello? Yeah, as -salam if, as -salam wa alaykum. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, since we are done with now, uh, uh, and you are, if you are ready, let's start your lecture. Okay, very good. So, so let me uh, introduce Dr. Saeed Adikulle. Uh, you can see his... Uh, his picture on the screen, inshallah, uh, he will make a presentation on uh, evolution of hyperalkaline cementitious composite utilizing high volume cement waste derived portlandite. Okay, so Dr. Saheed uh, is our faculty member, senior assistant professor. He, uh, uh, he did his uh, master's and PhD from uh, KFUPM. Uh, and okay, and uh, his area is structures and materials. Uh, he is one of our active faculty members, alhamdulillah. And uh, uh, he has been working uh, in developing the new materials. Uh, very recently, he has started working on sequestration of carbon dioxide in concrete. And uh, uh, he has, a, lot, he has a good number of research papers. He has filed petition also. Uh, uh, and... Uh, his uh, his lecture is very much uh, uh, very much relevant to to the people who are trying to trying to utilize the you know the waste material uh, in 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 making the concrete. So uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, uh, hear from Dr. Saeed. Uh, your uh, now floor is yours. Kindly start your lecture, Dr. Saeed Adi Kunle. Um, Salam alaikum. Yeah. Walikum salam. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, 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 we can see you. And your 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 lecture is on the screen. Now you can go to the presentation mode and start your lecture, please. You know, already I'm in uh, mode of presentation. Or should yeah. I? Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Now it is. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me on the Cakes Forum uh, for C Department. Uh, as I uh, was in the news. My name is uh, Saeed Adikule, and um, I'll be presenting the topic on the screen, uh, evolution of high alkaline cement composite, utilizing high volume cement waste derived polymerite. So I thank everybody for coming uh, for this uh, presentation, and I say salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good evening, regardless, I mean, de depending on where you're joining the presentation. So without uh, further delay, uh, let's go into the business of the day. 
Uh, first of all, I have uh, the following items for my outline. I'll go through some introductory notes. Then we need to discuss about the alkalinity of cement and its implications. Then we talk about hyperalkalization. Then we talk about cement dust, and that will lead us to the real focus of today's discussion. To that, some conclusions will be given. Now, first of all, uh, for those of us that are familiar with cement uh, chemistry, uh, so what you have there are the active minerals in cement. So those in red, this is uh, called tri, uh, uh, tricalcium silicate, and here is, uh, or we can call it a light, and here is another active mineral. This is called B-light. So these are, there are other ones there. We have here c light and ferrite. But my focus uh, on this screen are the, those in red. So these minerals, when they hydrate to form a hardened cement gel, the hydration of these minerals result to the formation of what we call portlandite, which is essentially calcium hydroxide, which you can see in red. So this calcium hydroxide has, is, is a highly alkaline material, or it is the source of alkali, alkalinity of concrete. So concrete, as we know, is a highly alkaline material, and the source of its alkalinity is the Portlandite or calcium hydroxide. So but what I'm going to focus on here about the Portlandite content of concrete is that this Portlandite content of concrete essentially has a very important uh, application. But before I go into the implication of Portlandite content of concrete with respect to the alkalinity of concrete, let, let's try to look into some threats facing concrete in actual service. So on the screen, you can see the atmospheric CO2 is very low. It's typically very low, like 0.03% uh, in preserved areas, like rural areas. However, when you come to large cities where you have a lot of emission from industries and from automobile uh, and similar, uh, similar machines, you see there is a high level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what is the CO2 concern with Portlandite in concrete? And as you can see on the screen, I'm showing you three chemical reactions. If you don't forget the active minerals in cement, those I highlighted in red in the previous slides, these are A light and B light. This A light and B light in aqueous media, they can combine with CO2 coming from the atmosphere. They will form what we call uh, calcite in addition to silica gel, silica gel. And silica gel itself has a higher porosity as compared to the original A light or B light. The consequence of the highly porous silica gel is more CO2 can come into concrete. But again, the A light and B light combination with CO2 is not still the main deal. Uh, on this screen. The main deal on this screen is the third chemical reaction. And this is the reaction of Portlandite with CO2 in aqueous medium to form calcite. The implication of the third chemical reaction is that we are losing the Portlandite, which is the main source of concrete alkalinity. And the consequence of loss is that the outer layer of any concrete member will have lower pH as compared to the core. So as a function of time, CO2 penetrates into concrete and the front of low pH continues to move inner and inner into the core of the concrete. And what is the real deal? What is the real problem with this loss of alkalinity? The real problem is here on the screen. Now, as you know, we usually have reinforcement in concrete element. And of course, there are alternative reinforcement uh, nowadays, but still up till today, still reinforcement still 
uh, does the best uh, out of the alternatives. For example, you have the plastic reinforcement that we use. These are more active in flexural regions and in compression regions, the plastic reinforcement are not so, so, uh, so useful, technically speaking. For that reason, the steel reinforcement still holds the biggest performance. But now when you embed steel reinforcement in a high alkaline medium uh, of concrete, concrete usually have pH of the, in the neighborhood of 13.0, typically, okay? But this high pH enables the formation and stability of what we call a passive protective layer on the steel or on the steel bar. And what is this protective layer doing there? This protective layer on steel bars allows protection. It's like an oxide because corrosion or rusting of steel in concrete is a big durability problem. But this rusting or corrosion is an oxidation reaction. So this passive layer over steel allows like shield of steel from the oxidation reaction, thereby making sure that uh, the life of reinforcement or steel reinforcement in concrete is prolonged. And this passive layer is stable at high pH. Now, if you look at the Portlandite combination with CO2, we are losing Portlandite to form a salt which is having nearly neutral pH. What I'm trying to say here is that CO2 will drop the pH and dropping of the pH threatens the stability of the protective layer. And that can result into serious durability threat. As you can see on the screen, when the protective layer is lost on the steel bar in concrete, the rust will start to build up. The rust has a higher volume compared to the original steel which not oxidize. Consequently, there is uh, pressure from the core, from this reinforcement bar. And this pressure will eventually crack the concrete. Cracking the concrete means the concrete is gradually going out of service. So this is a major durability challenge. But as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And when this CO2 comes in concrete, it causes what we see here. And apart from atmospheric CO2, and nowadays there is this trend of capturing CO2 as a way of trying to minimize or reduce the atmospheric CO2, which are released by human activities over time. So this capture of CO2 is a common trend. We were talking about problems, potential problems from natural CO2 diffusion into concrete. And nowadays, people are talking about trying to induce the capture of CO2 in concrete. So obviously, they are calling for more troubles. In addition to that, there are new technologies of curing concrete with CO2 as a further way to utilize CO2 in building materials. Again, this is more like calling for more troubles, uh, so to speak. Because we already saw earlier that CO2 can actually drop the concrete alkalinity. So, but then this is something very good to utilize CO2 in building materials. So we are now in a dilemma. There's a positive benefit of CO2 utilization in building material, but there is a negative consequence when the CO2 removes concrete alkalinity. Therefore, majority of researchers in this area, uh, advise the reduction of CO2 curing or usage in concrete, try to minimize, in order to minimize the negative effect of loss of concrete alkalinity. But trust me, whether you minimize or you don't minimize, you've lost something and you have to pay for it, okay? So now we come up with a solution. The solution we came up with is what we call hyperalkalization. Hyperalkalization is just a way to boost the initial pH of concrete. In other words, we are trying to boost initial alkalinity of concrete so that we can compensate, compensate for the inevitable dealkalization of hydrated cement matrix. Because we have seen that whether due to natural diffusion or due to the beneficial utilization of CO2 in concrete, we are faced with a trouble of dealkalization. So we try to compensate by boosting 
the initial alkalinity of concrete using a hyperalkalization agent. So we came up with this idea. There is what we call cement kiln dust. Cement kiln dust or cement bypass dust is an industrial uh, byproduct that results from uh, manufacture of cement. Uh, about 10% and, or sometimes more than that of CKD is generated from the manufacture of cement. For every 10 tons of cement, you have approximately one ton of CKD coming out as a waste product. This is a waste product which uh, is not utilized as much uh, world over. So as a way to achieve two objectives in one, try to see how we can utilize CKD beneficially and try to utilize CKD as a hyperalkalization agent in concrete. Because as, as you can see, uh, the reaction in box here is the, the dealkalization reaction when we are losing our standard content. But CKD itself has a high lime content. Of course, the lime content of CKD can vary, okay? It depends, can be 30% or 40% or something more than that in some scenarios. So the lime content of CKD can easily go into, into moisture to form portlandite. So this portlandite, which comes out of CKD, will effectively, and this is a theory, we have a theory, okay, or like a, a proposal or hypothesis that this portlandite can easily compensate for the uh, inevitable loss of portlandite due to CO2 interaction with concrete. Okay, so this is what we call the hyperalkalization reaction. So now, soon in, in my discussion, I will prove that this hyperalkalization indeed occurred and it's indeed effective. Okay, just follow the discussion as I move along. Now, we have seen the potential for CKD utilization theoretically to hyperalkalize concrete medium. All right, so now, what we did here at KFEPM is that we had a, a study where we took uh, two CKD samples, okay, from uh, some cement manufacturing companies in the Eastern province. Now, these CKD samples, can we coded them CKD1, CKD2. And what you can see is the particle size distribution of these materials. As you can see, one of them is finer than cement, and another one is uh, more coerced as compared to OPC, okay? Now, if you look at the x spectra shown on the screen, you'll realize that the CKD1 has less of lime as compared to CKD2. And as a matter of fact, CKD2 has got some Portland here. Uh, Portland in CKD2 definitely comes from it means CKD2 has a high moisture content, uh, which actually causes some of the lime to go into portlandite. Whatever the case may be, CKD2 appears to have more lime content as compared to CKD1. So what we do is just to subject the two of the CKDs to analysis to try to check their potential. We had a theory that can help to hyperalkalize concrete. So we try to uh, check the theory in uh, an experiment. All right, so now, before I go into our experimental outcomes, I want to discuss something negative about CKD. Now, CKD has a problem. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, CKD has a reasonable lime content. And when lime goes into aqueous media, as shown in this hyperalkalization reaction, the lime forms portlandite, and this reaction is exothermic. Exothermic means there is a lot of heat evolution from the reaction. And what you see on the screen here is the uh, cumulative heat transfer in, in CKD. As you can see, as compared to OPC, CKD releases more heat cumulatively compared to OPC. This is from the lower graph here. If you go to the upper graph, you will see that the rate of heat release from CKD is indeed very, very high 
within the few hours of hydration of CKD. And this is as compared to OPC, which will have the high rate of heat release much later than CKD. So what I'm trying to say here is that CKD is faster to hydrate in aqueous medium as compared to OPC. The consequence of the huge heat release of CKD into the mixture is that this heat release will accelerate the hydration of OPC. And it means CKD effectively is an acceleration agent, okay, for concrete mixtures. This acceleration is very good to gain high early strength, and it's very bad for fresh properties because acceleration of uh, hydration of CKD or of, of concrete will result into a, a poor workable mixture. The workability will be very, very bad. And for those who are into concrete technology, we value workability as well as workability retention of concrete. So seek will kill your workability on one hand and will kill more your workability retention due to high heat evolved in the early hydrogen. So this is one very negative thing about CKD. You see, CKD was seen as a hyperalkalization agent originally, and now we are seeing that it has a negative consequence on concrete workability and workability retention. So we have to solve this problem as well as researchers. So we try to solve this problem uh, in a way that will be able to utilize the benefit of CKD without or by and still minimize the negative impact. Now, what you see on the screen is what we call a prehydration system. What is prehydration system? Traditionally, all over the world, as far as we know, people use CKD in concrete like any other ingredient. But based on the information available here, we realize that we have to allow CKD to hydrate. Allow it to hydrate alone outside of concrete mixture. And when the hydration reaches a, 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 an advanced stage, then we can introduce the prehydrated CKD into the mixture. Uh, as far as we know, once again, uh, we've not seen anybody doing something like this. So this is looking uh, new to us, uh, basically. So what you see on the screen is a comparison of standard consistency. Standard consistency is what we use in concrete technology as a measure of concrete water demand, which is an indirect measure of workability and of course workability retention. So what you can see is that a prehydrated CKD actually has lower water de demand consistently as compared to CKD utilized in the traditional way of just making it straight away in the mixture. And this water demand reduction due to prehydration can better be visualized if I try to bring forth the initial setting behavior, okay? Now you can see the dotted line represents the, uh, the, the, the dry CKD used in the traditional uh, uh, way. So you can see that prehydrated CKD actually raises the initial setting time. Raising the initial setting time is a big indication of workability tension. You can see it, there's a shift of an approx approximately uh, 30 minutes in the initial setting time. The same thing is replicated for the final setting time. The final setting time was successfully shifted or increased by about 20 minutes, indicating a successful workability uh, improvement and workability retention improvement. By trying to prehydrate CKD as compared to the global practice of utilizing CKD in its dry form along with other ingredients. So now when we utilize a prehydrated CKD, and we know hydration of CKD leads to Portlandite. 
And this is the source of the term cement dust derived Portlandite. So this Portlandite that we have from the hydrated CKD has been derived from cement dust, which is the cement waste essentially. So now we are talking about cement dust derived Portlandite, CDP for short, okay? Now, if we see that the cement derived Portlandite has got a fantastic effect on the fresh properties of concrete, now, we need to investigate what is the effect on compressive strength of concrete. This is very important to us as engineers. As you can see on the screen, the early strength of concrete is not affected negatively. Up to 40% incorporation of CDP in concrete. I'm talking about the early strength. The early strength is not affected. Uh, as a matter of fact, up to 40%, the early strength is improved. In order to visualize this improvement in early strength, we have what we call strength activity factor. This strength activity factor was derived as a way of showing the benefit of incorporating CDP in concrete mixture. And as you can see, more percentage of CDP, you have, a, in, you have increased strength activity factor in concrete, which is a way to tell the story in a clearer way that CDP indeed improved early strength of concrete. Now, the late strength of concrete at 28 days is shown on the screen. And as you can see, of course, we lost, we lost something uh, at 40%. At 28 days, uh, there's a reduction in the absolute compressive strength. However, if you remember that 40% CD means you took out that much of cement by mass then it's a lot of gain for us. And here I'm showing the strength activity factor at 28 days. Of course, the strength activity factor is very, very low as compared to the early strength. Still, it's not zero. Zero means there is no benefit. But at this small higher SAF, it shows even the late strength was fantastic with the incorporation of CDP. So now we've seen that CDP does not affect the compressive strength of concrete, mechanically speaking. In, instead of affecting, it actually has a slight improvement in the compressive strength of concrete. So now, let us now go into the real deal. The real deal is trying to test out our theory on the possibility of CDP being a hyperalkalization agent. So we try to subject concrete to induced carbonation by pumping CO2 to concrete at a high pressure. What you see on the screen is the percentage of CO2 captured in concrete, uh, reference to the mass of cement content. And as you can see, higher incorporation of CDP increases as a percentage of cement, approximately, there's a, there's a slight increase in the amount of CO2 captured. Whether there is a slight increase or no slight increase, what happens here is that we have a proof, empirically speaking, that CO2 has been captured in the concrete. So having CO2 in the concrete shows that we expect the pH to be low naturally, okay? Based on the uh, re reaction shown earlier. But now we have to test out, having got a proof that CO2 has gone in tremendously, is there, is there a negative effect on the pH? Do we lose the alkalinity as expected? So let's see this in the next few slides. Okay, now before we go into test of alkalinity boost by CDP, let's look into some mineralogy uh, investigation. See, on the left, we have 0% CDP means a concrete which is made from 100% OPC. And as you can see here, the calcite content, okay, is nearly equal as we move from the outer layer towards the core of the concrete specimen, okay? Uh, the calcite content is nearly constant. Of course, this is expected because this is, uh, we, we, we cure this by moisture. 
There is no CO2 curing here. If there's no CO2 curing here, we don't expect the calcite content to increase. Nevertheless, there's a slight reduction of calcite content as we go to the core of the concrete relative to the outside. In reduction of calcite because the portland peaks have been normalized to the outside portland intensity. So this means that portland increases slightly towards the core. And of course, this is a uh, moist cured. A moist cured concrete with portland increasing towards the core of the concrete it looks like the core of the concrete has gone through a better hydration as compared to the outside. How do we explain this? How do we explain this? Well, the, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, in increase of calcite towards the inside or a reduction means increase of portland. So how do we explain this? This shows uh, we need to actually dig point to this and this is consistent. Okay, but now on the right side, this is the real message. The real message is on the right side. On the right side, we see that the CO2 cured uh, shows the calcite content reduces towards the core of the concrete. Yeah, and we have a higher calcite outside as compared to inside. This is the mineralogical proof that the outside has got more calcite and the pH is expected to be lower, okay? Conventionally speaking, okay? Now, here we have 20% CKD or CDP. With 20% CDP content, you can see that the calcite ratio outside is a lot more as compared to 0% that we showed on the previous slide. This showed that CKD or CDP content of the mixture boosted the calcite content, okay? And it, it boosted the CO2 capture. Means we again expected some reduction of pH. Now let's try to prove something here. Now on the screen, I'm showing you a test of hypothesis. We have the uh, hypothesis that there are five factors in this study. We had two types of CKD, and we have four levels of CKD content, 0%, 20%, 40 and 60%. We also had two levels of water binder ratio. And we have sampled from three regions, the outside region, the middle region, and the core of the specimen. Now, after subjecting a sample size of 96 specimens, to this test of hypothesis, we realized that the p-value for CKD content and water binder ratio is tremendously low. This is an indication that we have nearly 100% confidence level that only CKD content and water binder ratio affect the pH. And the CKD type, and most importantly for us, what is the most important is the curing regime. Curing regime means whether we cure by moisture or we cure by CO2. You can see that the p-value for curing regime is very, very high. This indicates that curing by CO2 or exporting a concrete to high level of CO2 under pressure did not affect the pH. Instead, what affected the pH was the CKD type and the water binder ratio. So this is like an empirical proof at nearly 100% confidence level that the CO2 curing did not affect our pH negatively. Okay, let me try to go further to show this in this box plot. Now, the box plot shown on the screen actually shows the increasing percentage of CDP in our concrete, okay? Now, you can see that as the percentage of CDP in increases, the pH value of the mixture increases. And more importantly, this is 0% CDP. It means here is a concrete 
without CDP. You can see that the pH came very, very low in some instances. Of course, we've seen that a higher water binder ratio reduces the pH slightly. And this is understandable, okay? It's understandable from, from technical point of view because a higher binder ratio will actually encourage hydration more than a lower water binder ratio. And more hydration, of course, means more Portland light. And more Portland light means more CO2 capture. And more CO2 capture means lower pH. You see the technicality there? So we expect slightly lower median pH when we increase water binder ratio. But the most important message on this screen, I'm sorry, is that without CDP, the pH was very low. And the moment you have some CDP, the median pH came up and it increases with increasing CDP content. Let me try to prove this further on the next screen here. Now, the next screen on the left shows the moist cured specimen. And on the right, you have the CO2 cured specimen. As you can see, when you cure by uh, moisture alone, you can see that the pH continues to increase with increasing CDP content. And by the way, the value of about 13.2 is very, very high. This is a proof of high efficiency of CDP for hyperalkalization of concrete. And on the right side, when you see the mixture without CDP, you can see that CO2 curing has dropped significantly the pH. And the moment you increase the CDP content, you see, even with CO2 curing, if you look at the left and right, you see with CO2 curing, you can see the level of pH is similar to the pH level without CO2 curing. And this confirms the hypothesis testing result which shows that the CO2 did not affect the pH significantly when the mixture contains CDP. Now, the message should be clear by this time that this CDP is an effective agent of hyperalkalization of concrete. So we can have the following conclusions. Now, first of all, the spent derived portlandite or CDP offers improvement in fresh properties of concrete. You see, it improves workability and workability retention of concrete. In addition to that, we've seen empirically that CDP boosted the early strength significantly, and there's a slight boost for the late strength of concrete. It, it means, mechanically speaking, we've got nothing to lose by using CDP in concrete. And more importantly, the incorporation of CDP in concrete improves the hyperalkalization of concrete. And more CDP, we have better alkalization efficiency. And finally, this is the most important of all conclusions in this discussion. You see, I told you earlier that expert warned that we should minimize the utilization of CO2 in concrete. But this hyperalkalization drive will give us freedom to increase our CO2 utilization in concrete with little or no concern about corrosion protection of rivers in concrete. This is the most important piece of science that came out of the study conducted at KFPM. I'd like to thank you for your attendance and your attention. I'd be more than happy to take your questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Saheed, for your very nice presentation, mashallah. Well organized slides, useful results. Okay, uh, so nice of you. Uh, now, this is the time for question answer. And I think there should be many questions from Dr. Saheed, and he enjoys right. questions. You see, uh, so please, uh, the faculty as well as the students are highly encouraged to ask the question. And now let us start with uh, Dr. Muhammad Nasir. Okay, I will I will give uh, I'll allow to. Okay, I, okay. Now, uh, Dr. Muhammad Nasir, speak out. 
Assalamu alaikum. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. Zaid, for your very nice presentation. You well correlated your results with each other. It was very interesting. I have a few questions. Uh, number one, I want to know how you uh, synthesize CPD from CKD. Number one, this is regarding this methodology. If you kindly uh, briefly uh, tell us about this. And secondly, uh, I was wondering that it would be interesting to know the results of CKD versus uh, C C CDP. Okay, so these are two, my two questions. Thank you. All right, thank you much, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, you, you've raised very important uh, questions. First of all, the synthesis of CDP is very easy. As I mentioned earlier, it's all about allowing CKD to hydrate externally before putting in concrete. But we simply take a cup, okay, put your CKD in the cup and add some water and allow this to stand for some time, okay? So if you do this, you are already synthesizing CDP. And let me try to show this quickly. Uh, where is it? Sorry, I want to go to the uh, dehydration curve here. Okay, now I showed earlier that uh, the hydration of. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I lost. No problem, no problem. Take it easy. Okay, I'm sorry. This is your desktop. Uh, yeah. Okay, can, you, can you can you see this? No, now now we can see. We can okay, see now. Very good. Very good. I'm sorry, please. Now, I was trying to show this screen. Now, look at this here. You can see that the CKD over time will continue to hydrate and involve heat. So this continuous hydration of CKD is what gives you CDP, essentially. It's a matter of just putting your CKD in a cup and putting some water and allow it to stand. Then what we did after that, is to try to dry the slurry. Because if you have CKD and water, you have a slurry. And when you try to take out water from the slurry, then you have a powder form of CDP. So it's more like a very easy synthesis. The second part of your question is that you wonder what will happen if we use CKD directly without, first of all, do the prehydration. It's a very fantastic idea, and we like to try that. Unfortunately, uh, we had the limitation of manpower, so we were unable to try what happens with dry CKD without first prehydrating the, the dry CKD. However, however, traditionally, people have been using dry CKD all over the world. So we can always pick up results for dry CK in the literature. I agree with you, it, it will be very good to use the same material, both in the dry form and in the prehydrated form. Unfortunately, due to manpower limitations, we could not uh, try the dry form. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, okay. Uh, another question. Okay, Dr. Khalid Hamad, you should have a question. Raise your, Dr. Khalid Hamad is here. Okay, any, any other students, uh, Dr. Salah? Dr. Salah, this is your area. Go ahead. Kindly ask the question, please. Okay, any other student? Okay. I can see engineer Khalid Mahasin. Have any question? Okay. Dr. Mubashir, go ahead. And where is Dr. Asad Hanif? You must I'm, have a question. Fine with it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Self explanatory to me. Yeah. Still, we have some time. So, another five minutes. Let's have some question. Okay. Uh, can you go to slide number 20, uh, Dr. Slide number 20, 20. Just uh, one small uh, query. Yeah. Here, uh, you know, at 30% replacement level, why it is going down, the CO2, up, and then it is going up again? Yeah, actually, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for this question. Yeah. You can see there is a linear reduction in the percentage of CO2 capture. Mm. So 
produced linearly. But remember that as we're putting more CDP, we are taking out cement, okay? So it, this one simply proves that CDP is not as efficient as cement in capturing CO2. This is what this proves. Because as we reduce cement content, then the CO2 captured reduced continually until 30%, okay? But don't forget that we have a cement dominant regime, okay? Mm -hmm. When cement was dominant, cement content controlled the CO2 capture. But the moment we switch from cement dominant regime to CDP dominant regime, right. then the CO2 captured increased again, almost nearly. And remember, again, that what we have here is normalization of CO2 captured with respect to cement content. So cement content reduced from left to right. Mm -hmm. Cement dominant regime up to 30%. And when the CDP became dominant, then there is a reversal in the trend. So what we have is like a bilinear relationship. Okay. Uh, um, one more. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, one more thing. Um, this um, the composition of your uh, cement kiln dust is very important, and it may not be same um, at different uh, places. It depends on the on the raw materials being used in a cement factory. So how this work, uh, or uh, any, it should be empirical or can you have some rationalized approach to- Yeah, to... I, have, uh, I have, by the way, uh, empirical uh, composition values. What yeah. I do in this uh, presentation is that I wanted it to be very short and I want to focus. Uh. I wanted to focus on the alkalization or, or hyperalkalization uh, aspect. So I tried to take out a lot of interesting information from this presentation. So, but I have empirical evidence. And from empirical evidence, mm -hmm. uh, called CKD2 yeah. it has a higher lime content. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, this is my suggestion. You may correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, this is my suggestion. In the future studies, it, it should be, uh, you know, relationship uh, ship should not be in terms of percentage of uh, any any waste material for any purpose, not only here. It, it, is, it should be in terms of percentage of co some components which are important. Got yeah, me? You're, you're, you're correct, uh, Professor, but you know, when we have two points, we have only two points now, so we want to get the two. Mm. So, Connection between two points is a straight line. We will not be able to see. It will be nice if we have like four different types. Oh. And we can have line content plotted against certain parameter. But with only two types, the uh, line trend itself is not making good data. Yeah, yeah it's good. I can, I understand. I'm not talking and, about- and, and secondly, secondly yeah, yeah. we focus the line content. Of exactly. And we have only two cases, so yeah, yeah no, no. I'm, uh, listen, I am not. Yeah. This, this is okay. This is, uh, this is eye opener uh, study. Uh, now, in future, it will be really uh, fantastic if we relate uh, CO two sequestration level and the and the and the and the, and the improvement in the properties of con concrete. Right? Uh, I got the point. In terms of uh, the lime content, okay, so that the CKD could be. From any cement factory, from any, uh, any uh, in, even in another country, no problem. Okay, it varies. It varies significantly the, the the characteristics of any waste material from one country to the other within a country, from one plant to the other plant. So it should be our uh, and it should be your next uh, yani effort to to correlate the things with the with the with anything. Like for example here. Uh, CKD and CO2 sequestration, the important uh, element is the lime content. So we can have in terms of lime content and even we can make a synthetic solution if we don't have many the CKD from many sources. Uh, like let's say, what, what, what is the effect of the lime content? Synthetic uh, uh, CKD, I can say, uh, so that we can do uh, rationalized, uh, you know, uh, uh, investigation, okay? The, that would be fine. So, so if so, uh, if I have a CKD from any source, and if I test the CKD for lime content, 
and I get X percentage of lime content, okay, then I can make a prediction that, look, if I have this lime content, this is the level of uh, uh, CO2 sequestration I could achieve. Uh, of course, uh, water cement ratio, as you said, uh, another key factor after the CKD content, right? These are the two, two factors which had impact on the CO2 sequestration through there's your also, I'm, I'm sorry for interruption. There is also the particle size factor as well. Fine, fine, fine. That's also. So very good, Annie. Just for the future, I'm talking. The, 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 the work in the present form is perfect. Just as a big, it's a, I think it could be one of the uh, best research work in the kingdom. Uh, I think so where the CKD, uh, uh, the, 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 prob the possibility of using CKD uh, for the CO2 sequestration purpose would have been carried out. So thank you very much. Still, still we have two, three minutes more. Any, any of our colleagues or students wants to have a question answered by Dr. Saeed, please raise your hand. Still we have two, three minutes. Go ahead, feel free, feel free. Anybody? Dr. Alosta, you have any question? Okay, so now uh, we can conclude Dr. Sahid lecture. Very nice once again. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, we are, we are now... Oh, okay, Nasir, you have any question? Yes, Dr. Nasir. Yeah, go ahead, quickly. Two minutes. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you for giving me an opportunity. Uh, yeah. Dr. Sahid, I, I wanted to know, can you please... Uh, indicate some of some other agent besides CKD who can uh, boost the alkalinity? Well, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Nasser. Uh, from my understanding, uh, I pursued CKD itself because I saw it had lime content, high lime content. And I proved empirically that the expected result was obtained. So I will conclude that any material you see with a high lime content is an, it going to be a, a potential hyperalkalization agent. But by the way, by the way, we can easily use synthetic lime in our mixture. But what I'm trying to do is to achieve two things. Use a waste product, which also has a high lime content. You see, this is better for us than using the synthetic one. This is free, saving the environment and giving all technical benefits. So if you see any other industrial waste product that has a high lime content, okay? Of course, you can use any other oxide, for example, potassium oxide. It can give you alkalinity. But the issue is that potassium oxide or magnesium oxide will give you potassium carbonates or magnesium carbonate, which are not as good as calcium carbonate in concrete, you see? So magnesium carbonate, potassium carbonate, they are not as stable and as useful in concrete as compared to calcium carbonate. Therefore, I'll go for calcium oxide, which is lime, in preference to potassium oxide or magnesium oxide. So when you see any waste material in conclusion, which has a reasonable level of calcium oxide or lime, then go for it. It will prove useful as a high alkalization agent. So while you are trying to kill with CO2, or you're trying to prevent the natural ingress of CO2 from the atmosphere, I think there is a time, or I think a time has come, when the global concrete community has to think about hyperalkalization as a part and parcel of concrete technology. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Said. Now let's move. So nice of you. So now let's move to the last lecture of today's forum. Uh, and this lecture is titled as Advances in Wastewater Treatment Using Iron-Based Technologies. And uh, the speaker is Dr. Haytham el Naker. Uh, Dr. Haytham uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is a new faculty uh, who joined the department as assistant professor. Uh, he did his uh, PhD from Canada and uh, postdoc also. Okay, uh, his area uh, is water and wastewater treatment. So now let's uh, uh, let's uh, let's uh, Dr. Hatham uh, present his work, and inshallah at the end we'll have a question answer. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Hatham. Now we start, please. Sure, just trying to find the.
just share your file share your file you are very yeah. much on the screen yeah yes we can see your file put in the presentation mode and start yeah so thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak in this uh, uh, forum and actually dr sahid and the other presenters have made it very hard for me because of the excellent presentations they prepared and the excellent presentation skills. And uh, actually, this is now putting me in a very hot spot, especially that I'm new faculty presenting for the first time in front of the chairman and my colleagues. No problem. So, Go ahead. You are highly yeah, encouraged. I'm afraid. So no, no, please, no, no, highly no. encouraged. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go please ahead. don't fire me after this presentation. Astaghfirullah. You know? No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> because of my terrible presentation skills. Anyways. So actually, I thought about what I should present in this lecture, given the multidisciplinary nature of the audience. Then, you know, I typically adopt this model in my uh, teaching, this T model, where I give the students the dips, actually, in the topic I'm, I'm trying to teach. But also, I try to give them some breadth of knowledge that they can communicate to um, um, uh, people who may be not really experts in the um, area that they focused on. So the three areas I picked that I would like to introduce my work in. So my work is actually, or my presentation is related to the advances in wastewater treatment using our based technologies. So I would like to first introduce to the the wastewater and the wastewater uh, systems. You know that anything we consume, there should be a product or a byproduct. Like if we consume knowledge, we should communicate it in a certain way. Otherwise, it's going to be a problem if everyone would will, will you know, withhold the knowledge uh, to himself. Um, like industries, for example, also use water in the operations. Then there are waste streams that we have to. Uh, deal with somehow through treatment or recycling or other uh, things. I would like also to introduce to some of the local uh, issues here in Saudi Arabia. I have been lucky uh, that uh, I think 10 or 11 years ago now, I have worked with King Abdullah University uh, of Science and Technology in Thuwal, Jeddah, um, on, a, on a project related to evaluating wastewater treatment technologies in a small arid communities. And, um, you know, I had, uh, you can say, first-hand knowledge of some of the problems faced by the country here uh, related to the wastewater uh, treatment. And also, I will introduce very basic iron chemistry and its importance, actually. And this is a topic that uh, it is actually multidisciplinary. People who study corrosion, for example, steel corrosion, they study iron chemistry, and we study iron chemistry as well, but we use it in a different way. So uh, the outline of this presentation would be that I will start by um, introducing to the wastewater system components and the wastewater so sector in Saudi Arabia and the need for treatment, then why iron actually, why they select iron, then if I'm going to talk about advanced iron-based technologies, then I should introduce to some of the well-established iron-based technologies. Then after that, I will introduce some of the emerging iron-based technologies, which are the advances in uh, this uh, uh, area. So starting by the wastewater system components, actually, this figure uh, shows a conceptual diagram of the types of sewage systems that may exist in a in a in a typical uh, uh, catchment. You may have combined sewer system, which combines both the stormwater and the uh, you know domestic or industrial wastewater in the uh, same kind of of system. You got also the separate system, which is um, you. Um, handle the sanitary uh, wastewater separately from the storm uh, sewer uh, uh, system. Actually, um, you will find across the world that the three systems are um, in place some way or another. 
um, in 1960s in North America, they discontinued actually using the combined sewer system. However, it is still serves actually a lot of the cities because let us remember that sewerage network and wastewater treatment, this is an imp this, these are important pieces of infrastructure that you don't demolish overnight, you know. They stay with you for a very, very long time. So if they constructed a combined sewer system back in the day, th actually they are still um, uh, using it. So um, if it is uh, kind of, if the weather is, is dry, then you'll find this, this black is the dry weather flow. And this one, if actually there are extreme weather conditions and the wastewater treatment plant cannot handle the extra uh, wastewater, we bypass this to the um, uh, receiving environment. Also, during dry weather conditions, if the wastewater treatment plant is undersized, you may also bypass a lot of the wastewater to the receiving environment. And I have seen this um, in several plants here in uh, Saudi Arabia. And actually, like a couple of days ago, um, I found that um, a wastewater treatment plant that I visited, it serves um, a community in Jeddah called Bani Malik. Actually, this community will be demolished in the um, next uh, few years. Um, and one of the things I saw was that the wastewater treatment plant over there, they used contact stabilization technology. And this, this wastewater treatment plant is really, really undersized and it cannot serve that community quite well. So now uh, with the new vision, they are demolishing that community because a lot of problems related to infrastructure and they cannot serve the people uh, uh, very, uh, very well. So the, the, um, I did my PhD actually about the bypass wastewater. So during extreme weather conditions due to climate change or other reasons, the, the wastewater treatment plants, you cannot, you cannot design a wastewater treatment plant according to extreme weather conditions. This would be totally un, you know, infeasible, you know? That's why the uh, wastewater treatment plant I was working with during my PhD, they wanted to create auxiliary treatment uh, uh, train to handle the extra flows that the conventional wastewater treatment plant won't be able to handle during extreme. Um, uh, kind of conditions. In addition, actually, to what you see here in the in this figure, figure um, I have recently actually I had I had a look about the recent Saudi coup. Uh, I think the one related related to green construction, and I found that they are encouraging now um, um, uh, the separation of gray water from black water. So, what is black water? Black water as a, at, at the household level is the wastewater that comes from the kitchen sink and from the toilet flushes. And the gray water is the water that come from anything else, from wudu, um, the lavatories and, and other, other you know, uses other than the kitchen sink and the uh, toilet. And for the gray water, they are encouraging it to be treated and then reused actually within the uh, uh, building. So um, so I am saying this because actually this is very interesting that now it is in the code. And also for Mr. for our uh, chairman to know that I read the code and now I'm implementing it in the presentation and in the classes. Excellent. So, so I don't have to report that anymore. Okay. So uh, the second part is uh, actually related to the wastewater sector in Saudi Arabia and the uh, need for uh, treatment. And I found actually this interesting um, statistics from the General Authority for uh, Statistics related to the volume of treated wastewater. But what I would like to highlight here is uh, uh, this is the total volume of potable water for the municipal sector. And here they did a percentage to the treated wastewater to potable water. You can see here that typically 
if you consume water, it, it has to go out somehow. Same thing actually for uh, the uh, uh, potable water system. If, if potable water is supplied, then there should be waste stream comparable to the uh, uh the, uh that amount yeah but here you will find that it is 45 percent like it's on the average of 48 percent actually from 2010 up to uh 2018 here and there are several reasons actually for that one is the percentage of population covered by network the other is the losses in the network and actually the third one would be related to the bypass uh, wastewater, like the wastewater that don't go to the wastewater treatment plant to actually get treated. I also reviewed the national uh, water strategy here, the 2030 uh, strategy, and the um, the kingdom is one to move from that current municipal water consumption rate of 263 uh, liter per capita per day, liter per person per, per day, to a very, very ambitious um, rate of 150. And I'm not sure, like, this is really ambitious. I really hope that even they can go down to 20, which would be a great achievement in today's wor world, because like nowadays people take showers two times a day, will they give up one? Uh, time of of those for the sake of uh, not producing more water, or what would be the incentive for people to uh, reduce the water consumption? Also, uh, like the Kingdom acknowledges that the percentage of population with wastewater services is sixty percent, and they are aiming actually to go up to close to hundred percent coverage of the uh, wastewater network, which uh, would be a great thing to do. Uh, uh for the people because this would have a lot of benefits benefits especially related uh, those related to public health and uh, the rate of treated wastewater reuse it currently sits at 17 percent and they want to increase it actually up to 60 percent and i would say that by the way 17 percent is not bad like i'm coming from canada canada most of the jurisdictions are still struggling in creating uh, wastewater reuse strategies. Like in, in Alberta, like for example, I work with Edmonton International Airport, they cannot get a permit to uh, make a reuse to, like they separated the gray water from the black water and they wanted to reuse the uh, gray water for your toilet flushes and other purposes. It was really hard to get a permit for reuse like for that, so for the kingdom actually to to have seventeen percent right now and to move up to sixty percent in the next years, this would be an uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, thing to do. So uh, moving to the um, second uh, topic, which is why iron actually. So. Um, Allah brought us iron, and there is a whole chapter actually in the Holy Quran about the Hadith about uh, iron, and it 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 has great benefits to the people, as Allah said. Um, and um, uh, iron actually has um, uh, uh, is is the second uh, uh, is the second. Uh, abundant it's the second actually metal in the uh, yeah. earth's crust after um after aluminum here and um iron also has uh, several uh, chemical uh, forms L elemental iron itself this one it got actually uh, various uh, purities and it could be used as electrode materials in electrochemical uh, based treat treatment techniques. And we are going to discuss those actually in a, in a minute. And also due to its high reactivity, iron may exist in different valence states, such as the relatively water soluble uh, ferrous uh, iron here, and also the highly water in insoluble ferric um, and ferric hydroxide resultant um, uh, compound actually. And this um, and the, the ferric related compounds 
have been used actually as chemical coagulants in water and wastewater treatment. And I'm gonna um, describe what's, uh, uh, what do I mean by coagulant and coagulation in water and wastewater treatment applications in a second. And also there are the very high uh, valence state iron, which is a uh, ferrate up here that could be used as an oxidant, excellent oxidant, and also coagulant. This is under research in water and wastewater uh, treatment uh, uh, applications. Also, iron produces relatively non-toxic uh, by, by products, and that's why it is one of the um, you know, widely uh, used uh, chemicals in uh, wastewater treatment and in uh, water treatment as well. So I would like to move to the uh, established iron-based technologies. And I would like to start with a process of coagulation. In the coagulation, we may use ferric chloride or ferric sulfate um, um, as a, a, a coagulant. And so what is what is coagulation? So if you've got a source water or um, wastewater, water or wastewater actually, the water or wastewater uh, particles are typically, they are negatively uh, charged and they are somehow, they are in a stable condition. Now you wanna treat the particles in the water and the wastewater. So the one of the very first steps we, we may do, especially in surface water treatment, is to um, introduce that to a coagulation tank. So we add a coagulant under rubbed, very rubbed mixing conditions to wake the particles up. Those coagulants are in are positively positively charged. So with the negatively charged, we are encouraging them to come together. Then after that, we introduce a flocculation uh, step under gentle mixing, mixing conditions. We are encouraging the positively charged coagulants and the negatively charged coagulants now that we waked up to come together and form larger particles that, that we would later remove in a subsequent step called sedimentation. So we would have those particles settle in here, and then we will have somehow clear water that um, we could handle later on through filtration and disinfection and release to the particles if, if we are talking about water uh, treatment to train. Also waste, in wastewater treatment to plane, coagulants are being used in um, precipitation. So the ferric chloride here is perhaps actually the easiest and the cheapest coagulant to source, which makes it a, a popular uh, a choice actually in some uh, industries and for some water and wastewater treatment plants because it is source it is actually sourced from waste material from steel making uh, facilities so it may be considered a relatively green option as it is highly uh, recycled but the for the ferric chloride um, you know it should be handled properly because there are some safety uh, conditions related to chlorides because it may corrode down actually and wear the metal. So it has to be uh, kind of safely handled. For the ferrous sulfate, it is also ferrous sulfate, it is also a very high effective coagulant for industrial usage, uh, depending on its availability in the uh, jurisdiction that uh, wants to uh, use that for its water or wastewater treatment. Ferric sulfate may be cheaper to source actually than other uh, coagulants like aluminum sulfate, um, um, but it is not really really available in every location. You will find here that I'm going to introduce actually iron electrocoagulation as one of the established iron-based technologies. Then I'm going to introduce it again actually in the um, emerging iron-based uh, uh, technologies. So electrocoagulation or iron electrocoagulation is a process actually to remove contaminants by using electricity to neutralize the negatively charged particles by formation of hydroxide complexes in water. So we discussed a minute ago the chemical coagulation 
uh, that we add chemical to uh, positively, uh, th those are positively charges, uh, charged uh, uh, compounds into the water to attract to the negatively charged contaminants so we can remove them subsequently in uh, downstream processes. Now we produce here those coagulants in situ. So we pass current through the iron electrode and then this would produce several here derivatives of the iron and also it would produce some air bubbles that may assist in getting those contaminants together and also uh, help them float to the top of the tank so we can remove them and um, <clears throat> So uh, this is a, a very, very old process. So back in 1880, uh, a US patent has been filed uh, related to that. And then in the same year, actually, uh, a sewage treatment uh, plant has been uh, built in the UK. And, but, you know, I would say here, what, 50 years after its inception, it has been abandoned actually because of the high costs associated with its operation. But again, in 1947, more research has been conducted and they said, okay, look, it would be suitable for small installations rather than making that sewage treatment plant for London. No, we can use it for small communities outside the capital. And in the 1970s, they started also to use that uh, kind of application for the handling of uh, wastewater uh, um, out of uh, industrial applications. So now let us move to the core of this uh, presentation, um, which is related to the emerging iron-based technologies or some of the advances actually uh, related to the iron-based uh, technology. So in my PhD, I try to revitalize actually that technology again and bring it back to the treatment of domestic wastewater. Because yes, it has been actually studied a lot in uh, industrial wastewater uh, applications, but for domestic wastewater applications, I would say it has been abandoned, like the research in that area has been abandoned. And at the time, we had a, a collaboration and a fund from one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in North America called Gold Power Wastewater Treatment Plant owned by EPCOR. And they wanted to investigate some of the technologies that could handle bypass wastewater, which is um, uh, the wastewater in excess to the wastewater treatment capacity that may happen due to extreme weather conditions or actually that the population upstream has increased significantly and, you know, and other things as well. So they wanted to be, investigate other technologies that they may use uh, down the road uh, um, as an auxiliary treatment or also to upgrade the existing wastewater treatment uh, trains. So we thought about, so they currently, they currently use actually um, kind of coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation um, to handle the bypass wastewater or the wastewater that come to the plant during wet weather conditions or extreme weather conditions. And they provide some partial treatment using, IR, using coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation. Then they release the, that to the uh, receiving environment, which is in, in this case, it is the North Saskatchewan River. So we said, okay, look, so you got actually, you have built sedimentation tanks in place. So let us try to select technologies that you can use in the future to retrofit the sedimentation tank in place and uh, help you in increasing the treatability or the treatment of extreme weather conditions, wastewater. So uh, that's why I'm saying that, yes, iron electrocoagulation is an old technology, but we are here trying to revitalize it and use it for domestic applications after a long time of, uh, of uh, research break, I would say. So here we tested actually the efficiency of iron electrocoagulation in removing the uh, soluble chemical uh, oxygen demand. 
at neutral pH and at two temperatures, um, uh, one at 23 degrees Celsius, which is the room temperature, and also eight degrees Celsius, which at that plant, they receive that during the winter uh, months for obvious reasons. It is in Canada after all. So um, we aimed actually at, we didn't find really kind of systematic approach to model that uh, process and that they try to just use models that has been used for normal absorption on solid phase to model the electrocoagulation kind of, 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 of system. So we try to come up with some assumptions and appropriate also experimental protocols for how to use those absorption models and if you can, whether actually you should use them uh, at all. And also try to elucidate some of the mechanisms of removal of soluble chemical oxygen demand and electrocoagulation. Um, uh, in this study, we found that the temperature uh, effect actually, um, the temperature has a significant effect. And actually, I'm claiming that this has been done for the first time uh, for kind of treatment of domestic wastewater using iron electrocoagulation. So you can see here that with the increase of uh, time and with the increase also of current density, you can achieve very high removal efficiency to the soluble chemical oxygen demand here, which is a surrogate parameter to a lot of the contaminants in the uh, wastewater uh, uh, stream. Also here, we try to come up with some models. So the testing conditions uh, or under the testing conditions um, in this study, um, none of them has resulted in the total oxidation of ferrous actually, uh, because you don't want, want to have, so let me put it this way first. So iron, elemental iron, when you pass current goes to Fe2 state, which is ferrous, then you go to the ferric state. The one that you really want to target is the ferric state because this is the insoluble state that will settle or float. And this is where the particles will um, attach to. And uh, by the end of the day, you want to get rid of the particles. So ferrous, if you have a lot of ferrous in the uh, system, this means that this system is um, inefficient. So under the testing conditions of this study, and we tried actually um, several wide, very wide range of, of conditions, we found that you cannot oxidize ferrous actually uh, completely uh, under that. So this was one takeaway that we should find a way to deal with ferrous and help it to be oxidized uh, very quickly. And then the second one, you cannot get a, a the second takeaway out of this study, you, you should not get an absorption isocert that has been applied in equilibrium kind of conditions. And then you come and, and come and apply it to a very dynamic uh, process. So here we introduced uh, the variable order kinetic models. Um, here I am presenting the Langmuir variable order kinetic model that actually it has fitted the data so well, it makes sense because it is variable order and it, it may account for some of the dynamics that's happening in the system. But more research actually should be done in this domain to produce some uh, models, dynamic models relevant to this uh, process other than just uh, getting uh, things from uh, other fields that don't work in here. The second emerging iron-based technology is potassium ferrate. And again, for the same reason, we tested potassium ferrate for bypass wastewater treatment uh, uh, purposes. Uh, potassium ferrate is a multi-purpose agent. At the beginning, it acts as an oxidant. Then after that, the byproducts would be, could act as an excellent coagulant, actually. So uh, um, 
it has been tested actually for with various contaminants, including phosphates, pharmaceuticals, microorganisms, but mostly in synthetic water uh, matrices. And this is actually one of the major things in most of the environmental engineering research work that typically researchers take, take the easy way and spike a contaminant in clean water matrix and then test the technologies that they want to uh, uh you know uh test and they say oh the technology is working oh very nice but now will it work when it comes to a real wastewater mat matrix with all the competition that would happen from other contaminants because we are not treating only one contaminant although you may be targeting that contaminant in the wastewater matrix but this would be in competition with other contaminants and pollutants as well so we took the, the challenge here and we tested the potassium ferrate on, uh, on real wastewater matrix. And also we did that based on the understanding uh, that has been developed over the years from the research articles that use synthetic wastewater because synthetic use wastewater work is very important probably in removing other competition and kind of uh, uh, trying to come up with a removal mechanism. But by the end of the day, this removal mechanism would be specific to the case, to that case. It cannot be kind of generalized on a typical wastewater uh, matrix. Uh, so the work actually of potassium ferrate has been conducted over two studies. The first is represented by this slide. So in this graph, it can be noticed that there was no point of maximum or minimum response for uh, for E. coli here. Uh, the, uh, its removal actually was found to increase with the increase of both the mixing intensity, the mixing speed, and also with the increase of uh, potassium uh, ferret. But on the other hand, if when we measure total suspended solids under the same conditions, we found that total suspended solids, solids removal exhibited actually uh, optimal responses. This means that beyond a certain dosage and uh, mixing speed in here, uh, removal efficiency starts to decrease which in turn shows that the removal of total suspended solids can govern the selection of the optimum dose and the mixing intensity when applying this in real field uh, scenario. So the second study related to potassium ferrate is related to its consumption kinetics. So starting with the consumption, uh, uh, so we tested here first order model and second order model those, those have been widely used in the literature, and we introduced a new model called the double exponential uh, model in this uh, research, actually, for the first time to be applied on for potassium ferrate <laughs> application. In this model, there has we, we, we noticed an initial rapid reaction phase and then a subsequent slower reaction phase, each of which actually is modeled as a first order reaction. The first phase, this, this, this phase, could describe the rapid dissociation of potassium ferrate due to the disinfectant or oxidant demand exerted by organic substances in wastewater. And then this second phase can represent the potassium ferrate consumption beyond the oxidant demand uh, effect. Uh, here also, we uh, kind of elaborated on the disinfection because we had here, I described before this treatment train that you get the wastewater into coagulation, very rapid mixing. At a very short time, you introduce the chemical. In this case, this is potassium ferrate. In the other case, you may add a coagulant. And then you have a flocculation and then you have a sedimentation. Most of the studies, they tested the um, E. coli here and here as well. And they didn't tell us what happens actually in between and the contribution of each process to the overall removal efficiency of that uh, parameter. So we attempted to do that here. And we found that the sedimentation process actually contributed almost half of overall log removal, which means that uh, 
the coagulation effect actually out of the uh, uh, potassium ferrate application uh, um, might have worked uh, very well in enhancing the settling of uh, contaminants in the sedimentation state. So let us move forward here. And then after that, we tested a, um, a, a new technology, a hybrid potassium ferrate iron electrocoagulation system. Uh, Dr. So, Haitham, salam alaikum. Yes. Uh, five more minutes, eh? wrap up, so that you really? can receive the question. So, that, no, no, your, your presentation is fantastic, very enriched. So, just wrap up so that we'll have some question answer. Yeah, okay. I, will, I will finish with this one, then we can have a question. Yeah, yeah, Thank go you ahead. very much. Yeah. So, they, they, we found actually that post potassium ferrate and iron electrocoagulation, they have their limitations, but they can complement each other. So, the limitations of potassium ferrate. Um, that we found uh, were that the resultant particles of potassium ferrate have shown more nanoparticle uh, size, uh, no, more nano size particles with negative charges, which contribute to the colloidal suspension stability. The last thing you want to do is to increase the negative charges actually and uh, uh, in the system. So research suggests that it cannot be used as a sole coagulant and subsequent coagulation process may be required. This is for the potassium ferrate. And then now for the iron electrocoagulation, it has resulted in excessive ferrous concentrations. And I think I have described this before. And then research suggested that either aeration, pH adjustment, or providing more residence time can help the ferrous to get fully oxidized. But we said, hey, let us put potassium ferrate on iron electrocoagulation and it, the nanoparticles that would be generated during potassium ferrate kind of oxidation step can enhance the coagulation uh, uh, capability. And also when potassium ferrate is, uh, reaction is propagating, the pH increases and that would also assist in converting the ferrous to, to the desirable uh, ferric hydroxide precipitates. So that's why we introduced this, this process and we found actually very nice results here, like the ferrous at certain conditions can go down to 10% of the total iron, which is great. And also the soluble chemical oxygen demand can go up to uh, 55 and 60% here, which also is a great uh, outcome, given that we are introducing this as a soon standalone treatment for uh, bypass uh, wastewater. I got other technologies here, but they are not mine. So I would uh, stop here and then start to uh, receiving questions from the audience. Thank you very much. So nice of you for your very nice presentation. Very clear with a with a high level of clarity. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And uh, there's no no worry of anything. You have passed the <laughs> test. Inshallah, <laughs> Lazim. <laughs> okay, now this is time for the question and answer. And I hope that towards the end of our forum, uh, there will be a lot of questions to Dr. Haitham. And now we start with uh, our our student, uh, Engineer Usman Ismail. So Usman, I'm I'm allowing you to speak. Now you can you can speak out. Go ahead. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum uh, Good day, Doctor, and thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, so, as we have stated, you did your PhD on uh, iron based technologies, and you received some funds from a company which helped you to do your research. Um, so, I wanted to ask, like, uh, maybe even though you are new, but I don't know if you have had a look at our current labs. So, I like I want you to speak on uh, maybe the. At this stage, maybe the preparation of our labs to conduct research based on uh, iron based technology, maybe at this current uh, stage. So, one of the good things is actually about iron based technologies, especially if we are going to go with uh, iron electrocoagulation, that I can do that in my office without a lab because all what we need is steel or iron electrodes and um, something to pass the current into. So, it's a uh, but. Yes, the, I have a, I had a tour actually with Dr. Vohra, who kindly kindly invited me to have a look at the labs over there, and they are actually in excellent shape. So we got jartists. Everything is there for us to, for me, if I would like to establish a research in this area. 
to start working on iron electrocoagulation. And this is actually a very hot topic uh, that um, I am really looking forward to start working on it here at KFUPM. Thank you, Osman. I will give you extra mark in the, <laughs> in the assignment <laughs> or the quiz. OK. Another question uh, I am expecting from other faculty or student. Please guy, kindly go ahead. Dr. Vohra, if you have any question, brother. Any question? Uh, OK. Dr. Vohra is here, and I think he left. Any any other, OK, uh, any other faculty or, OK, Dr. Mubashir, kindly go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Dr. Uh, Dr. Haitham, mashallah, it's a wonderful presentation uh, containing a lot of a lot of useful information. Uh, and even uh, somebody like us, not from uh, environment, yeah. can get an idea. <laughs> so, uh, I just have a question that uh, you are proposing uh, an alternate of the wastewater treatment for some some other methods. You know, uh, whenever. Uh, they think of wastewater treatment, the major challenge uh, always uh, is the energy consumption of whatever the method you are proposing, because that, contrib that, that contributes towards the overall objective of the system. So how efficient, energy efficient this system would be as compared to the existing systems? Actually, this is an excellent question. And um, I forgot to mention this during the presentation, because nowadays, most of the electrocoagulation work, it is solar driven. It yeah. is solar driven. And this is actually a huge motivation now to revisit this technology and revitalize it because it is very nice technology. You can recycle iron, get iron kind of, of uh, derivatives and use them in water and wastewater treatment while not consuming kind of the uh, conventional from conventional energy sources. You can just be solar driven. And the work in this area is advancing very well. And uh, I hope I can do something similar here at, K at KFUB. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Very uh, much. Dr. Hatham, I, I have some concern. Uh, just go back uh, on your slide where you are showing the percentage removal of CO2, C, uh, COD. Uh, and uh, this oxygen. one or the other one? No, no, go back. Very in the beginning. This one? Uh, but, uh, yeah, hold on. Very nice. Uh, I can I can think just I'm, I'm, I do agree with Dr. Mubashir that your presentation is so clear that even we materials guy can understand. Okay, uh, very uh, simply in a simple way. See here, uh, <clears throat> there is a good correlation. I can I can see the correlation between the efficiency of the treatment. Uh, okay, uh, uh, and the time of exposure and the current density applied. Like for example, you are uh, having eight milliampere per centimeter square, fifteen and twenty-two milliamp per centimeter square, right? Yes. Th this is the current. I think you are uh, just uh, like this is uh, the current density. Yeah. A current, like you are. I, I think you are doing uh, some, uh, some, and you are applying the current for uh, dissolution of the Fe into Fe ions. Excellent. Yes. Correct. Oxidation. This is for oxidation yes. of the yes. metal, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, one thing is that we can have a uh, correlation uh, and we can have equation for COD, percentage COD removal uh, as a function of uh, current density and the duration so that we can we, optimize. Yeah, we can, can we? do that. We could do that differently. We could. Yeah. And then, OK. Yeah. So like that, you can you can inject some mathematics here. Uh, OK, uh, some um, correlation also. And uh, what I'm, can you go back one more slide? The setup, the set, yeah, here, here, mashallah. Yeah. So this, uh, this uh, iron plate, um, uh, I think uh, the surface condition or the composition of the, of the iron, which is there, uh, may also impact the, dissolution level uh, and that will that will impact all the coagulation process and removal process right yes so yeah. there are different purities actually Ava, purity purity yes. are 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 we yeah, and what are the different things we can do uh, instead of just just simply putting uh, uh, an iron plate uh, did you find any research work uh, for uh, related to such kind of uh, 
uh, yani you know technology where where we can we can enhance the uh, removal efficiency uh, using even the different uh, quality of the iron plate are you getting my Spike. point it yeah, is yeah. it is, they studied this actually very uh, mm. deeply and even iron plates we can get them and recycle them without mm. doing any uh, work on really mm. increasing the, their purity to a very high level mm. and this is one of the very nice things about this technology that you can mm. use all all purities and let mm. us remember that this mm. is one electrode and yeah. there are another electrode that could work with us as well. So Correct. we can use advanced kind of electrodes mm. yeah, um, for the system and incorporate it with the iron. Yeah, another okay. thing we uh, sorry, another thing uh, we can do. Uh, I think this dissolution is on the surface. So instead of using one piece, if we can make a lot of strips having the same area, same amount, that can you uh, increase the the specific surface area that more dissolution will take place under the same current and during exactly the same duration. Correct? Yes. That, you, you, uh, you know, Dr. Shamshad, you should move to our area. <laughs> because you got it all here. Yeah, okay. Or I am a good teacher. Or I am a good, a good are, presenter. No, no, you are the best teacher, not the good. Okay. Uh, okay. And a good another presenter, thing, I mean. Another thing also, uh, I am I, just like a layman here. Another thing I, I would like to add here, uh, that you can make it uh, more novel if uh, you can use some some uh, admixture uh, we say in the in the concrete language something uh, uh, in addition to this uh, fe dissolution under the current uh, some 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 material like catalyst uh, that that should yes, not sir. add to the cost huh you know and, you know we added here uh, we mm -hmm. used here a hybrid method we added yeah, yeah. potassium ferrate in addition yeah, to maybe the iron. I, I would have not mind. Huh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. yes but yes. also we could add polymers and other. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, what I'm saying. Uh, yes, yes. Now yes. there are so many, you know, so many nanomaterials are coming. Uh, got my point. Uh, that yeah. could be that could be even explored. So I think this is very. I'm really, really uh, highly encouraged with this idea which you brought uh, to to us. That th there's a lot of scope, uh, you know, uh, for doing research work in this area. Uh, yeah. I, as I said, that you can you can you can open uh, different um, fronts uh, uh, for this technology. Ani, uh, one front using different. Uh, you know, nano materials for just one objective co for common objective that that we should have maximum removal removal efficiency at the lower cost. Correct or not? Yes, yeah. Yes, certainly. Yes. yes. So, uh, any other question, um, uh, my dear students and my dear colleagues? If there is any other question, otherwise, 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 uh, we we have we have concluded this forum. I hope I hope in a very nice manner, inshallah. Particularly. Uh, this was just big beginning and uh, I have planned now uh, uh, many things in my mind, inshallah, slowly. Uh, and if any, 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 our student or any faculty member or the group of students and faculty member uh, publishing a good work uh, in a Q1 journal, I think we, we will have, uh, we will collect two, three such works completed and then we can have a forum so that a lot of confidence will be there. Uh, when we do that quality of the work in any area of our four option area. Wallahi, this, this platform is really very highly useful. Uh, we don't, we should not be under pressure that why so many attendees didn't join from outside the department. Even uh, if we are, like for example, this is another technical communi communication among ourselves. Uh, we should know each other uh, technically so that we can develop the idea of having interdisciplinary uh, research work alhamdulillah among our uh, our faculty member first and then we can go for multidisciplinary after interdisciplinary so uh, dr haitham uh, don't think that there were only 20 25 uh, attendees even 10 were there and who were serious and who could even have uh, five percent of your idea the, the purpose is served this, this i'm telling to encourage all of us who are right now uh, present online Okay, and inshallah, Lazim will continue. And once again, I really, really extend my sincere thanks to all the speakers who have really, and beyond my expectation, you people have prepared, all of you uh, prepared excellent slides, excellent topic, and excellent de delivery. 
and on time. All of you have finished your 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 uh, talks, your your lectures on time, and you have you have attempted to answer all possible questions which came up from the audience. So with all these things, and inshallah, lazim, hoping to meet uh, once again on this forum in in near future, inshallah. So salam alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much to all of you. So this way, this forum has come to an end. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum.